As we proceed towards a climate neutral 2050, we are reaching the point where we put theory into practice, especially when it comes to hydrogen. So far, European efforts concerning hydrogen have been individual initiatives for the most part. The time has come for an integrated approach to gather our best ideas and put them to work in an actual region. The European Union has identified the Northern Netherlands as Hydrogen Valley. That's not surprising. In one ride, you'll find everything you need for a green hydrogen-based economy, sustainable energy sources, generation, storage, transport, as well as applications in industry and applications in mobility and our day-to-day -day environment. This time, the project partners are not researchers. They are makers. They will make the hydrogen economy flow. To achieve this, the project comprises of four clusters and will be realized by the end of 2025. With the region's green power converted to hydrogen, we will be working on storage and infrastructure, making hydrogen a raw material for our industry, turning hydrogen into heat and power for residential areas. And it will give us mobility, green mobility. This sectoral integration is rarely seen. We are doing it right in this valley. We are progressing on some 30 sub-projects we have prepared over the past two years, hand in hand with public and private parties. We're working hard to set an example for Europe to follow Hydrogen Valley. As we proceed towards a climate neutral 2050, we are reaching the point where we put theory into practice, especially when it comes to hydrogen. So far, European efforts concerning hydrogen have been individual initiatives for the most part. The time has come for an integrated approach to gather our best ideas and put them to work in an actual region. The European Union has identified the Northern Netherlands as Hydrogen Valley. That's not surprising. In one ride, you'll find everything you need for a green hydrogen-based economy, sustainable energy sources, generation, storage, transport, as well as applications in industry and applications in mobility and our day-to-day -day environment. This time, the project partners are not researchers. They are makers. They will make the hydrogen economy flow. To achieve this, the project comprises of four clusters and will be realized by the end of 2025. With the region's green power converted to hydrogen, we will be working on storage and infrastructure, making hydrogen a raw material for our industry, turning hydrogen into heat and power for residential areas and it will give us mobility, green mobility. This sectoral integration is rarely seen. We are doing it right in this valley. We are progressing on some 30 sub-projects we have prepared over the past two years, hand in hand with public and private parties. We're working hard to set an example for Europe to follow Hydrogen Valley. Good morning to everyone and welcome back. Um, let me first give a short review on uh, yesterday and then uh, we'll introduce today's program. Yesterday we introduced the topic of hydrogen by walking through the entire value chain. And Achim told us about Horizon Europe, an important funding mechanism. And Roland Berger discussed the concept of hydrogen valleys actually for the first time. Roland Berger has written a report on this topic that serves also as a basis for today's casework. Today will be all about hydrogen valleys. 
And before we go into work on the case, we have two keynotes. Uh, first of all, uh, Bart Bibuik, the executive director of the SEH GAU, the fuel cell hydrogen joint undertaking, and Petr Knubben, the architect of the Heaven project. Uh, Petr will be introduced later by Racheli. Let me first introduce Bart. Bart Bibuik is since 2016, the executive director of the fuel cells and hydrogen joint undertaking the FCHJU, a public-private partnership aiming at facilitating the deployment of fuel cells and hydrogen technologies in Europe. Under his leadership, a strong emphasis on cooperation with cities and regions led to the creation of the European Hydrogen Valley Partnership with around 40 European regions. Dissemination of project results, building technology awareness and enhanced basic research became his key focusing points. Bart's term as the executive director of the FCH JU was extended for four years until the 15th of May, 2023. Bart, could you please introduce uh, today's um, uh, um, masterclass about hydrogen valleys with a short presentation. Bart, the floor is all yours. Good luck, thank you. Thank you very much, Jochen, for your uh, kind introduction and good morning, everybody. So yes, I will talk a bit about the um, hydrogen values that we organized in Europe, but also a little bit on the hydrogen strategies that we have in Europe. I'm um, supposed, I guess, to share my uh, screen. So um, let's do that quickly. Um, one moment. The microphone sounds a bit far away, Bart. Yeah. This you don't hear me well? Well, it's, it's good enough, but... Okay. Uh, maybe I can try to set another microphone setting. If that maybe works better. Let's see. Select, select a microphone. Um, let's see. Is that one better? Do you hear that much better or not? Uh, it, this is good. This is good. We can hear you. Thank you. Okay, good. All right. So I would like to explain today a little bit the importance of the hydrogen valleys uh, from, of course, the European perspective, but also a global perspective. Maybe just a little bit about the fuel cells and hydrogen joint undertaking for those who would not be yet familiar with the FCHJU, but we are a, a public-private partnership uh, with a very clear objective to accelerate the, uh, the research and innovation uh, for uh, hydrogen and fuel cell uh, products. Um, we have three partners, since it's a public-private partnership, we have three partners, two are privately, uh, it's Hydrogen Europe, the industry grouping, and then Hydrogen Europe research, research grouping, and then we have in the middle the European Commission. Uh, Commission is of course very important because they put really the cash money on the table for us to fund all the projects. Uh, today we have 285 projects supported for just a little bit over 1 billion euro, uh, but also the private members have contributed an equal amount of 1 billion euro. We're working in uh, three areas, uh, energy of course, it's hydrogen production, electrolyzers, but not only, also very low TRL technologies we are doing. Also transport, and then we cover road vehicles, more transversal topic, standardization, safety, education, and so on. Um, of course, we're also working with uh, Israel because we have, uh, of course, Israel joined uh, Horizon uh, 2020, and I think you're in the course of also joining Horizon Europe. And so um, we have three beneficiaries in, in, in Israel and also three projects uh, over there. Um, of course, with the Netherlands, we have uh, plenty, plenty of beneficiaries and, and, and projects with them. And I think it's uh, one of our, uh, one of the countries that is most active in the FCSG. Um, everything started a little bit in, in Europe when we made the first roadmap in 2019, where we tried to create a, a hydrogen vision and how hydrogen could contribute to the uh, European market. Uh, by 2050, and that the result was uh, quite uh, impressive. 
24% uh, of the final energy demand in Europe in 2050 could be supplied through hydrogen. <coughs> Sorry. We could update uh, 560 million tons of CO2, generate 820 uh, billion euros of uh, revenues annually. And then, very important, 5.4 million jobs could be created in Europe. So that led, of course, uh, to a lot of countries to have some interest really to, to look seriously at hydrogen. And when we analyzed last year the uh, national energy and climate plans for each of the member states, um, you will see that it was actually reaching the same area of uh, the 2050 uh, vision that we have. First of all, for each separate member state, you can find it on our website. You have the link there. So if you would like to know for a certain member state uh, details. But when we combined the EU27 plus the UK at that time, uh, we came to uh, a, a scenario. Basically, we analyzed two scenarios. We analyzed actually a high uh, scenario and then a business as usual scenario. And the most ambitious scenario, uh, we came to uh, needs of uh, 56 gigawatt of electrolyzers uh, to be deployed across Europe, um, which would give us a 30 billion euro added value and 358,000 uh, 358, jobs. And that's by 2030. So that means, and in a bit less than 10 years, that could be the potential in case of a high scenario and when we have the right policies. Um, that led then also, also to the European hydrogen strategy, because if the Commission saw that all the national energy and climate plants had so much hydrogen, in, so why don't we make a European hydrogen strategy? And that European hydrogen strategy has three phases. The first one is in 24, where we will put six gigawatt of electrolyzers in the field. Um, mainly to replace existing hydrogen production, which is now 96% is grey. Um, then, if until 2030, we want to put 40 gigawatt of electrolysis, uh, renewable hydrogen, of course, electrolysis in the field, 10 million tons of renewable hydrogen production, looking into new applications like steel, but also heavy duty transport, uh, electricity balancing purposes, and so on. And there you can also see the topic of the day, creation of hydrogen valleys. Uh, and then in phase three, we believe that the technology should be matured and then we can really roll it out in, in, in many, many sectors, especially in, in hard to abate sectors. All these uh, phases are supported by a alliance. We call it the Clean Hygiene Alliance. And actually they have to make an EU investment agenda. I mean, you can imagine that this three phases will not be uh, realized only by public money. We need a lot of private money as well. And so the Alliance, what is it? Well, it was also launched at the same time of the, uh, the when the strategy was announced. Uh, their mission is they have to make a really a pipeline of um, clean hydrogen uh, technology projects. And they will, we will involve all the stakeholders, so the whole ecosystem, supply, demand, and so on. So we estimate that around 430 billion euro will be necessary to be invested by 2030. Of course, some part will be public, but I mean, majority will be private. The Alliance itself, they organize themselves in six round tables. You can see the different round tables there, which is always led by a CEO. Okay, now we come a bit more closer to the hydrogen valleys because we started this journey back in 2016, <coughs> where we started to work with the um, regions because uh, we were I mean, I personally uh, was very much in the belief that uh, regions are very close to citizens and they need to deliver solutions to the citizens uh, to decarbonize their area. And that's why regions uh, of Europe, which, uh, and, which are many, and we, had now, we have now a kind of MOU with around uh, 100 regions in Europe. And you will see that some of the regions are quite advanced and some of the regions are just starting with hydrogen or discovering hydrogen. And that's why we had like different programs roll out for each, depending on the status of the region. And for regions who are quite well advanced, is, uh, we had the European Hydrogen Valleys Partnership uh, I mean, 40 regions joined, it's led by the Netherlands, by the way, uh, together with uh, France and Spain regions. But also we had some uh, project development assistance program for regions that really are just at the beginning, uh, they take the first steps into the hydrogen field and to help them to mature their ideas and to real projects. 
and um, we will launch by the end of the year another uh, such a project development assistance. What do we do is basically we pay a consultant uh, to each region, so around 50 working days to help that region to build their case and then to prepare a project that then they can go and look for funding or financing. And then we had really regions that I want to go the, yeah, I would say we really want to lead the whole thing. And that was, for example, the region of North Netherlands. No? And that we came with the Hydrogen Valleys Initiative. And it was very nice also to see that uh, last year, our president, Ursula von der Leyen, really picked up the Hydrogen Valley concept. And she mentioned in her um, State of the Union speech uh, that she said that I want to see more uh, European Hydrogen Valleys in Europe. And she wants to use actually this next generation EU or the recovery fund in order to create such a uh, next generation uh, hygiene, European hygiene valleys. A few examples of the hygiene valleys, and I have to say that we had a, a first start really with a big hit. It was not yet really a, a hygiene valley. We called it at that time a hygiene territory, to be very honest, um, because also it was a bit smaller scale. But it, 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 I would say it was really kind of a start of the idea. Uh, it's in the UK, it's at the Orkney Islands. We produce hygiene on the uh, islands, we bring it on shore, and then it's used for uh, some powering, some transportation, or also so for eating uh, sources. But then we really wanted to go uh, all the way, make a big hygiene valley, and I think later Patrick uh, definitely will explain it. Uh, it's in the North Netherlands. Uh, for us, what was very, very important on a hygiene valley, and, and, and I think it's, it's, it's crucial also in your workshop today, that it has to be a sectoral integration. So um, I know, and we will come to that later a little bit, um, that maybe some people think about hygiene values only on transportation, or what we want to see is that we include transport, we include storage, production, we include also heating and cooling, uh, we include industry. So really that it, it's like an ecosystem that you make in a, in a certain area. So where, you, where we can show that all uh, different sectors are working together and can use hydrogen because that's where you get the synergies. And then finally, the third hydrogen valley is that we wanted to create a first uh, European hydrogen island. Um, because islands, if you put all the people together are uh, living in Europe on an island, you get, uh, I think it's the seventh biggest member state. So we should not forget all these islands. And so and I have to say that hydrogen was not really discovered yet by the islands, and that's why we wanted to make a project on the islands. And again here, it's the island of Mallorca, by the way, in Spain. And, and actually, here again, the sectoral integration approach, you can really see it again. They use it for heating, they use it for transport, they produce it, even they build a pipeline where they will transport the hydrogen. So again, um, the sectoral approach. Of course, we will not stop there because we are thinking now, okay, what's next? And we want to build, uh, and we will have a call next January on the next uh, hydrogen valley. But for us, it will be important to have it across border. And today, you can see that each of these valleys are in one single member state. Uh, Europe is about working together across member states. So that's why we want to go cross border. I mean, there are many ideas. We can work around ports, airports, industrial hubs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and create maybe the first hydrogen city. And that's the uh, also then on a more global scale because Europe really wanted to bring um, hydrogen valley concept in Europe also on a global level, and we did that under the mission innovation, and there uh, we we proposed to to work all together globally on on creating hydrogen valleys across the globe. As you can see, we have now and this we did together with Roland Berger. You see, we have 34 valleys now identified from 19 countries. There's a lot of data there. Please go to the website, uh, h2v.eu, to find all the details. There are good in-depth best practices. So I think if you, in your workshop, you want to learn a bit more and have some good ideas, I mean, go to visit there, uh, the, that website, I would recommend. I mean, what, are, what we found out is that there are kind of three archetypes of uh, hygiene valleys uh, globally. I mean, you have a very local one, very small uh, scale, and as I said, very much focused on mobility. Be careful what I said before, is that in Europe, we really want to focus on this sectoral integration, but if you look at globally, uh, there is a bit of a divergence. And you will see that, as I said here, in archetype one is really focused on mobility. 
but then you have archetype two, which is uh, again very local, medium Recording scale, stopped. but also they have industry uh, in included. And then finally, the archetype three is really a huge scale huh? Recording uh, with also progress. more an international uh, approach and, and 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 also looking to to export. I mean, we have also, for example, uh, the port of Rotterdam starting to look for export, etc. So it's these are the three archetypes, and I think it's it's, it's good also in your workshop to think. I mean, if you would like to create, for example, Hydrant Valley in Israel, what is the type of archetype that you would like to make? You really want to see it bigger, you want to start smaller, so think about that. It all has its advantages and disadvantages. So, <coughs> what came out as well out of the study, and you can see the report, you have also the link then to the report if you would like to, to go into more details, but um, still, um, all the hydrogen valleys, they are still suffering of making the business case uh, really financially or sound without public funding. So clearly today to make a hydrogen valley without public money seems to be quite difficult. So um, I think it's important, it's definitely now in the beginning, that you bring also um, the regions or the government, depending on the, on the structure in every country, to bring them on board and bring them on the table. Um, actually, for us in Europe, to create a hydrogen variant and the call, for us it was crucial that the region was leading it. Huh? Because honestly, if you do not have the support of the region, it's very, very difficult to create a hydrogen valley. So think about that to bring those the public authorities on board and make sure that they are actually taking some kind of leadership role in your hydrogen valley. Also, important is to find green hydrogen off-takers. Make sure that you create a demand and sign long-term contracts with them. Because it's very nice, your ideas, and uh, but if you do not have long-term contracts for hydrogen, your business case, again, become very, uh, let's say, very weak. So make sure that you find them and, and, and sign long-term contracts. Um, then, Still, I mean, the technology we are developing, I mean, fortunately, that's why we are here to help to develop the technology, but we realize that the technology is not always ready yet. And so we will uh, make also uh, further RNI activities to mature the technology. But also when you build a, a hydrogen valley, don't think that you can just buy the technology off the shelf. There is always a certain level of research or innovation aspect into it. And that's where I believe also here, yeah, where you can bring in then the public authorities because that's a field where they feel confident to support, you say. And then to have also the legal re um, regulatory support. I mean, again, the business case is very hard to make, but if you have the right policies there, and, and, and honestly, even regional um, authorities can help to have some good policies to support, uh, to make the business case. So again, here, get them into the consortium from the beginning. Um, that was the conclusions, uh, which I fully support, of course. What we will do now is also in Mission Innovation 2.0, which was announced at the beginning of June, uh, we will uh, continue uh, a clean hydrogen mission and we will continue uh, to develop hydrogen valleys across the globe. We have set ourselves a goal to create 100 uh, hydrogen valleys across the globe, uh, with, uh, of course, in the countries that are part of mission innovation. And each country has committed to at least have three hydrogen valleys in their country that are participating in, in mission innovation. Of course, some might have more, otherwise we will never end up at, uh, at 100. But I think it's a very firm and good commitment. So uh, we will soon start to work again uh, on this. And um, as I said, we will continue to do R&I, continue to make a hydrogen valleys. Um, some people might know already, but the fuel cells and hydrogen joint undertaking will stop uh, by the end of the year and we will create a new partnership which is called uh, clean hydrogen joint undertaking uh, our budget has increased uh, a lot i mean we will get now one billion euro for uh, seven years and what we will do is mainly uh, to front load a little bit the program so you will see that uh, next year already we will spend uh, 300 million euro 
so almost like a third of the budget we already spent in the first year, really front-loading the program because we have those, uh, we have a European hygiene strategy that we need to achieve the objectives, so we need to uh, accelerate. Um, the idea of the whole research is really, and, and this program is again to keep the European global leadership role. I would say that clearly Europe has a leadership role in hydrogen and fuel cell technology, and we want to keep and even uh, become stronger into that. And uh, the next program will really have, again, three pillars, but a little bit different than what I explained at the beginning. So we will have the hydrogen production, that remains the same. But then new is the hydrogen distribution, really looking into pipeline, uh, looking into liquid carriers, uh, like ammoniac, for example, uh, but also non-pipeline transportation, liquid hydrogen. So these will be the new things for us. Um, refueling infrastructure, uh, hydrogen refueling station for multiple applications. So far, it was always for cars, but we have to look into trucks, aviation, and so on. End use uh, for the transport vehicles, we will mainly move now towards heavy duty for the heat and power. We look at and now also into uh, turbines and, and, and hydrogen, pure hydrogen burners. It's new for us. And we will continue to work in the industry. And then as a transversal, let's see the topic hydrogen values. The idea is to have to every year to have a, a topic, a funding topic on, on hydrogen values. Of course, we would love to have also hydrogen values in eastern part of Europe. We see a lot of them in, in the western part of Europe. And so for us, that's I mean it's good to start with that. Well, if eastern part of Europe do not create hydrogen values, it's not okay. So we really need to make some effort there uh, to, to get them on board. Um, for the rest, I mean, the cross-cutting supply chain will remain uh, the same thing. What is new is that hydrogen will not only be treated by our joint undertaking. Of course, we are the kind of mother joint undertaking, I would say, or mother partnership, but also now other partnerships like uh, processors for planet for the chemical side, two zero for transport, waterborne for maritime, clean steel, of course, for the steel, clean sky for aviation and EU rail, they all have the mission and their mandate now to also have topics of hydrogen uh, funded. Of course, they can do many other technologies as well, but they need to address also hydrogen. That means of the 1 billion euro in our partnership, also more money, funding money from the other partnerships will be added on top of that. So I believe that we will go to 1.3, 1.5 billion euro even if we have all those other partnerships as well. Uh, funding money. That's my last slide now. That in is a little bit PR. So we will have the second European Hydrogen Week at the end of the year. Um, it will be held at the 29th of uh, November to the 3rd of December. This is, I would say, the biggest um, conference in, in Europe on hydrogen. I mean, last year we had more than 10,000 people joining from 63 countries around the globe. Uh, you know, we have a lot of commissioners. I mean, last year we had five European commissioners, a lot of uh, ministers from different countries, uh, director generals of the European Commission. So it's really high level, but it's really to discuss between private, so, I mean, the policy uh, members ex explain a little bit that their expectation to the industry, the industry replies to that. And that's a bit the game that is played. And it's very interesting to know where Europe is heading for, if you really want to know. So be there. And that's it. Here you have my contacts in case you have uh, further questions. Thank you very much, Bart, for your inspiring uh, presentation. Um, as you mentioned, Israel, so we heard you also here at the uh, conference that took place on the 13th uh, of July. Um, we have very limited time, and I want to just um, ask you one question that came from uh, Eli Winkler from Israel, if you can uh, relate to that. And that is um, <clears throat> beyond the hydrogen economy, the funding and the politics, if you can also relate to a professional labor force. The reason I'm specifically asking this question has also to do with our workshop uh, these three days, in which among others, Jochem and I are trying to see how we educate uh, people in different countries, some of which currently do not have hydrogen valleys. And we have representatives in the audience from the Eastern European countries, from uh, Africa, from Asia, from South America, and therefore, uh, if you can uh, relate to uh, the needed uh, skilled human uh, resources. Yes, so indeed, um, preparing the labor force is now something which becomes very, very uh, important. Also for us, will be a focusing point in the next years. 
Uh, when I talk to business uh, leaders, uh, CEOs, uh, now their biggest concern is really to find the right people. I would say that today there is a there's a war for talent on hydrogen and fuel cell technology ongoing outside there. So we really need to focus on that. Um, we have already um, funded a lot of projects to um, to to educate, uh, let's say, people. I mean, different types. I mean, uh, engineers or, or masters, but also um, I mean, blue collar uh, workers and so on. So you can find those projects also on our website. But also on, on we have a, a website uh, which is the uh, FCH uh, Observatory. There you find all the material. So please use that material as well. I, it's free there for you to use. Um, but it's not enough. Uh, clearly, for me, it's not enough. And I'm, I'm now working on, on a plan how we can um, enhance the education uh, on, on hydrogen fuel cell technology uh, for workers. Um, I cannot elaborate too much on that because it's still in the phase of discussions and, and getting everybody on board because there is some different uh, opinions. I mean, uh, some of the people think that each national member state is his own responsibility to educate his labor. I would like to do it more, rather on a European level, so we will see where it ends. Um, we will need to create different programs. Um, we will have to work with, uh, I think, universities, but also with, um, let's say, um, these companies that, or, I mean, it depends on each country, but you have a lot of uh, institutes that needs to help people, uh, guide people to another job. So with those kind of uh, companies, we will have to work together. So there's a lot of work to be done there, and, and it's really necessary and urgently to start working on that. Uh, I can only be. Thank you very much. And uh, I feel that you took time to address this question. And as it is in the planning, uh, then I think it's very, go very good that we are also in touch with a lot of people from different countries so that maybe you can get their input as well uh, at some stage or benchmark um, any uh, plans that you might have. Taking um, the time into consideration, Bart, I'd like to thank you again and uh, take the opportunity to introduce my colleague, Patrick Knoeben. As I told you yesterday, and I will repeat myself again today, I, am, I work for the um, Dutch Ministry of Economy and Climate Change. And uh, we have a network of innovation attaches, which is called the Netherlands Innovation Network. And they reside in different countries uh, all over the world. In addition to that, I am specifically uh, situated at the Netherlands Embassy in Israel. And we have established here in 2016 the Israeli Dutch Innovation Center, or for short, EDIC. And EDIC has board members, and I'm very pleased that Patrick is one of our board members, and he helps us, of course, move forward the initiatives that we have in the field of energy transition and hydrogen. Patrick studied chemical engineering at the Hoogere Technical School in Herland and chemistry at the University of Amsterdam in 1993. And he has been employed successfully by three consultants Philips Energy Research Center of the Netherlands, Price Waterhouse Cooper and Technology Center, North Netherlands, before his involvement within the Energy Valley Foundation. Within the Energy Valley Foundation, which is now merged into the new energy coalition of which Jochem is also part, he has been active for over 18 years now and responsible for the realization of large scale investments in the field of bioenergy and gas enhancing amongst else the production and use of biogenic energy carriers, such as green gas, bio, liquid natural gas, and hydrogen. Patrick is the architect of Heaven, the Northern Netherlands Hydrogen Valley project, which Bart just mentioned, and involved in many green hydrogen related development projects. Recently, Patrick has been appointed the coordinator of the green molecule program, green hydrogen, green gas, with new energy, uh, with the new energy coalition, where further development of these novel value chains is key from idea, generation, knowledge development to realization and operation. Patrick, please inspire us. Well, <clears throat> well good morning. Thank you very much for um, introducing me and having the opportunity to elucidate on our uh, Hydrogen Valley approach with the Project Heaven. It's always uh, good to be named the architect of heaven. But let's get to the ground and start building hydrogen valleys. And 
uh, before I start my, uh, my, my presentation, I would really again like to thank the tremendous help, the tremendous help we had have received from the fuel cell hydrogen journal taken by BARTS, BARTS club, so to say, without these initiatives, without the fuel cell hydrogen journal, this is impossible. And uh, therefore, uh, again, Bart, I can't uh, repeat it enough. Many thanks for that. And I think you are doing a tremendous job. And that will be even increased by the future, uh, uh, the coming future, where a lot of um, opportunities and challenges will be there. But we have to do this. We don't have the luxury of not engaging with hydrogen in, in full. And the hydrogen valleys are a good model for that. Uh, but it's not the only thing, of course. We need to keep working very hard, as Bart explained two years ago at our last Wind Needs Gas conference. Now you started, and I got, got good news for you. You have to work even harder. This is um, a thing you can only achieve by working tremendously hard, get inspired, and transpire. That's the way to success. But for now, that's that. Thank you very much for inviting me, and let me um, elucidate on how our approach to the Hydrogen Valley and uh, how we did that. So first, let me get the screen, the, the screen, the, the share screen um, on the view. I think this should work. And now I have to put in the light. Oh, great. Yeah, it doesn't work. Okay. It's always testing. Uh, as a chemist, I'm not really uh, into all digital things yet. So uh, you have to uh, apologize my um, some clumsiness with digital infrastructure. Well. We um, in the North of the Netherlands have engaged in uh, in becoming a hydrogen valley, and we are on the on the road of let's say maturing that idea and uh, realizing the project. I named the presentation "From Heaven to Hydrogen Valleys," or actually this "From Hydrogen Valleys to Heaven," and further on, of course. And in our region, we have a specific case. I try to explain that and elucidate on that. Let me get started. First, where are we located? We are located, let's say, uh, along the coastline, along the, the Warren Sea coast, which is a part of the North Sea coast, and that's actually within the yellow dot. That is our Hydrogen Valley domain. Uh, Hydrogen Valley is a, is a very, let's say, you know, defined geographical area. We'll come to that later. And, and i also try to not repeat uh, the, the very good things Bart said, but we, we try to do it in our three provinces, the provinces of Groningen, Drenthe, and Friesland. And in some cases, we also collaborate intensively with the province of North Holland and specifically the northern part of that. And as you can see, we are located quite uh, well along the uh, North Sea coastline. And uh, there are some specifics to that. We'll come to that later. So this is our location. But what has brought us to engage in becoming a hydrogen valley? This is a, 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 a graph which indicates a part of the region uh, in which you can see the gray dots, the gray dots or the the, 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 let's say the, the, the gray areas are natural gas fields. And you see a very big gray one, that's the so-called Slochteren field. And natural gas has brought the Netherlands a lot of prosperity, but in recent years also some, let's say some, some troubling issues like little earthquakes. And the, the red and the reddish and the rose dots are the number of earthquakes in the region. And these earthquakes have uh, a magnitude of a maximum 3.4. So um, it's nothing to compare to what happened in, in, in other countries like in Kobe, but still it is very annoying and it's disrupting, let's say, the comfort of the people living there. And that situation has led to the decision of the Dutch government to stop the exploration and exploitation of the Slochteren field, which is at the time it was invent, uh, in, 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 um, found in, in the 19, late 1950s, it was the largest on ga onshore gas field in the Netherlands. It brought us a lot of prosperity. We are uh, bringing the gas to um, 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 what's this? Uh, all locations um, in... Can you see my image again still? Because, yes, we can. Because I can't. <laughs> um, there it is. Um, Something had. Um, so it has brought us a lot of prosperity, uh, but still the, the penalty is that we are going to stop the exploitation and that leads to a um, effect in the region. And the effect in the region is that we uh, are going to run down the production from the Slochten field, which is the biggest field in the Netherlands. And that has a, has a direct effect on the regional economy. 
top graph you see is the cumulative production from the field, etc., going down. Here it was even projected to stop the, 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 the gas extraction in 2025. Two years ago, our government decided to stop the extraction in 2023. And the, the, the bottom graph indicates the effect on the economic growth in the northern Netherlands. And you can see a dramatic effect, even going up to minus 10% uh, um, on the regional uh, gross product. So that's a big, 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 a big problem. It also involves, let's say, the livelihood of 20,000 people. 20,000 people are involved, direct or indirectly, in our natural gas value chain in the Northern Netherlands. So, based on the principle that a, a region needs a business, we created a plan together with Professor Ed van Wijk, uh, one of the colleagues of Frank Wouters, whom you uh, have, uh, from whom you have, had, have had a presentation yesterday, if I'm correct. It's, the plan is called Green Hydrogen Economy in the Northern Netherlands, and that has jump-started the whole development uh, let's see, four years, four or five years ago. So what's going on? Because we are, um, let's say, uh, we have mastered the, the, the art of extracting and distributing and transporting natural gas. Natural gas is a molecule, predominantly the methane molecule. We think that based on the principle that a region needs a business, we can make a step from natural gas to hydrogen gas. It's a molecule. We, uh, we think that this molecule and this business fits us as a glove in the region. So that has brought us to the, to, the, to the situation that we have engaged in preparing a Hydrogen Valley application at, um, in a competitive call with the FGHU. We, are the, we, we were the lucky ones to win the first one. And if you win, that's fine, but there are some people who don't win. Um, and we really would like also to, um, to um, um, support Bart's uh, uh, suggestion to get more hydrogen values in Europe, as President von der Leyen said as well. So we think knowing natural gas gives us an edge in um, uh, preparing uh, to produce hydrogen, transport it and use it and become a hydrogen value. Um, what's now the, 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 what, what are now the, the, the main assets in the region? We have infrastructure, we have harbors, we have energy infrastructure, predominantly natural gas and power. We have transport infrastructure, roads, um, harbors, etc., airports. Um, the sectors are there. We have industry sectors, of course, as most regions have. We have a mobility sector, public transport, uh, trucks, logistics, etc. We have a quite a quite an advanced built environment uh, uh, in the Netherlands with almost every house connected to the natural gas grid, and that's a very interesting. Um, proposition to engage into hydrogen, transforming it from natural gas to hydrogen. And of course, the net balancing is something which will uh, take place later on. Therefore, you need big renewable resources on the North Sea, conversion capacity to, to balance the, uh, the imbalances in the grid. And human capital and innovation, very important. We have to design, we have to construct, and if you build things, you have to maintain these installations. So we need to educate skilled workers from the, let's say, the vocational to the MBA level to uh, help us and help um, the region uh, to um, uh, manage this task because it's something you need to do and uh, you need to have the skilled workers who can cope with the electrolysis fuel cells. It's different technology and you need to skill people in that. That's very important to have a uh, operating uh, system in uh, now and in the future. Here is a graph uh, I borrowed from uh, my colleagues of Gazuni. It's also supported by, uh, let's say, uh, European Union through the TEF funding. Um, here you can see the North Sea offshore wind parks, onshore uh, solar farms and some wind farms. This electricity, this power comes onshore and uh, is then either being transferred over the power lines, but the power lines are limited in their capacity. So uh, using uh, the existing natural gas grid gives us an edge. So what we are going to do, the power comes on shore, will be, electro uh, will be let's converted into hydrogen via the electrolysis process. Then it will be evacuated into pipelines, but it will also be stored in underground gas caverns. Now we have a, a very interesting location called Zuidwending, where there are uh, natural gas uh, uh, storage in, in the soil caverns that will, uh, some of these uh, caverns will be, let's say, uh, built to, um, um, to uh, facilitate and to store green hydrogen. 
And from there on, we can evacuate the hydrogen in the existing natural gas grid. We can transport it via trailers to fueling stations and other applications. We can use it in, in industry, mobility, built environment. That's the storyline which you can see here in a, in, a, in a, let's say, in a depicted way. Um, but how to do that in a region? Um, actually, you need to organize all kinds of parties and projects. And that's as led to the initiative. I think this is four years ago, February, 20, no, three years ago, it's February 2019, where the region with its industry partners have designed a investment plan on hygiene, hygiene investment plan 1.0. Um, that plan can see it comprises a lot of projects and uh, to total totaling into an investment sum of about 3 billion euros to help the region become de decarbonized in which hydrogen plays a tremendous important role. And so that was the start for that. Then we uh, got the invitation to uh, think about becoming a hydrogen valley. And here actually you, you can see a one of the pictures from the Roland Berger and uh, FCHU uh, and Mission Innovation Report. I think that will be distributed amongst the, uh, the participants. You can see three types. So um, um, the early, early stage, some trucks, some tuning stations, et cetera, uh, even up to the, the top right, that is deep penetration of hygiene in society. So we are at the moment somewhere here. We're actually more progressed to the right uh, and what we want to go here. That is our path, and that will be enabled, will be made possible through becoming a hydrogen valley and acting as a hydrogen valley, and actually projects which are there. So, a recap: we think our region is very well situated to develop a green hydrogen economy, become a hydrogen valley because we have the access to the North Sea, which is vast. Let's say wind, uh, offshore wind potential. We have good connections with Norway and Denmark and other countries. We, we will also look into importing green hydrogen from, let's say, uh, sunny regions where the, the sun was harvested in the form of, uh, of green hydrogen, which is a very, very interesting and very relevant uh, de development. We have the large scale industries which already use a lot of hydrogen, predominantly generated from natural gas. So this conversion can be quite smooth, I would say. It's not really easy, but it's not rocket science, but it's it's uh, it's not something you can do in an afternoon. You have to create a lot of work for that. And we have the underground storage and the gas transmission system, which enables us to, to make these steps. So we have the potential to scale up, but also if you can produce on the long term a lot of green hydrogen, we can also distribute that via sea, but also via land through the pipelines. And that hits on all kinds of policy uh, uh, drivers, like decarbonization in the built environment, et cetera, et cetera, mobility, et cetera. So we think that together with our regional governments, we have a very good proposition. And based on the principles I said, a region needs a business. I think we can make this step and be an example for the Netherlands, but also for Europe. And again, we want to reach out to parties who want to, let's say, get more knowledgeable about hydrogen values and this this um, um, uh, workshop, this symposium, as you organized, uh, Marelli and, uh, and Jochen and other colleagues, is very helpful in that. And I hope it spreads the word and generates a lot of enthusiasm with people. So let's get to the Hygiene Valley. Uh, this is, a, let's say, our um, our logo for the region. Um, our heaven, our Hygiene Valley project is called Heaven. It states uh, It's short for Hygiene Energy Applications for Valley Environments in the Northern Netherlands. Fantastic, uh, um, and this this model really works. We um, have a consortium. We are the lead partner. We have thirty entities from seven EU countries: uh, Netherlands, Germany, Denmark, Belgium, UK, Spain, and Ireland. Um, over and the parties engaged are varying from big companies to smaller companies, uh, mid-sized companies, associations, knowledge institutions. The, the works. It's it's a little ecosystem in itself. But uh, we also got a lot of support, as you can see here, from abroad, from Europe and outside of Europe. Let's get to the to Heaven uh, project. This is our logo. And actually, you uh, are looking to the, uh, uh, be welcomed in the first Hygiene Valley of Europe. This little animation, it's, it's in the link. You can open it. I will not open it now. But it's, it's, it's um, uh, describing how we want to get get going and we want to be finished by the end of 2025 to be fit for the the, the future um 
And of course, again, we cannot do that without the help of Europe and especially, especially the fuel cell and hydrogen undertaking. Um, here you can see a terrifying uh, picture, which is intended. This is the project. Uh, but if you can take some time to look through it, you can see four dotted blocks. These are the clusters. We have four clusters. Uh, within the clusters, the projects are arranged and uh, integrated with each other. And the blocks are integrated with the other blocks. So that creates our hydro valley. And what, we can, what you can see is to the top left, some windmills, that's indicative for the North Sea. Power comes on shore, is transported over power lines, and the power lines are tapped on to produce hydrogen via electrolyzers, um, uh, for instance, at the chemical park in Del Seal, at the high stock location in Veendam, but also uh, a, a, a study is there to develop a 100 megawatt electrolyzer executed by NG and partners. Projects are very, very diverse. It's production, it's uh, of hydrogen, it's usage, utilization of hydrogen to produce green methanol. It will be used to facilitate the production of green kerosene, biokerosene for aviation, a very, very hard to abate sector. We will have uh, an inland watership running on hydrogen, bringing salt, a natural salt, rock salt from the Del Seal area to, uh, to Rotterdam. And that is a business case. And it also uh, um, activates uh, very strong partnership with uh, with uh, not only the region government but also the, the national government but because they have also identified that this is a very good way to help regions get and embrace the hydrogen proposition and get a their contribution to let's say the Paris goals. We have um, underground storage under preparation. We have applications in the built environment in the in the municipality of Hogeveen. I do see my colleague. Uh, uh, Willem Hasenberg uh, relaxing at the screen now. He was one of the uh, the driving people, uh, driving factors behind the development of that project. We have other kinds of projects. We have a, a very interesting proposition in Emmen where there was a natural gas cleaning installation which has been decommissioned, but the underground infrastructure will be repurposed by Shell and partners to construct a electrolyzer and this electrolyzer will directly be coupled to an industry park in Edmund together with a T, uh, T connection to a fueling station for buses. Again, also co-funded through the FCHU via the Jive project. So you can see everything fits together. This is a very nice puzzle with, with all the, the pieces followed together. And of course, we have a, a, a fairly large mobility uh, section where we can uh, facilitate up to 105 passenger cars, I think 10 trucks, 10 heavy uh, duty uh, uh, trucks, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and it's a developing story. And so this is a project, but the project has um, resulted in a lot of attention outside of the project. So we try to uh, connect all these projects outside of the project to this endeavor, because then it makes sense. Then you can really become a hydrogen valley because it's not about one project, it's about growing it's about growth and uh, anticipating and uh, getting more people to do this this is an overview of the parties as you can see 30 it's updated some of the parties have merged have undergone some name change to this is the most actual one and again in in this complete picture we need always to uh, emphasize the importance of the union and the fchu because without them this is not possible this is a very important partner in this endeavor Having said that, we are making a step to, let's say, the national level in the Netherlands. You can see a, a graph of the Netherlands. Again, I borrowed this from my colleagues of Gassini, where you can see that the yellow lines are the, the natural gas pipelines, which will be repurposed into hydrogen pipelines. And this region is our hydrogen valley. So these projects behind the yellow screen are the projects in our heaven project, together with other projects coming by. And that um, uh, helps hydrogen mature and become from one project to a situation where you can roll out to mass applications, more or less. Um, that, again, and you can see on the, on the right hand side, again, this yellow screen has led to the development of a new hydrogen investment plan in the region with a investment volume of 9 billion euros. So this project has helped to initiate 
and support and stabilize a fairly larger development. And that's a very good thing. So we are all interested, and you, as you can see on the on the left hand side, I think Jochem can also share this 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 leaflet with you. Um, it's I think nine pages or so. This is our um, um, our uh, um, offer to the national government in Europe to become a hydrogen valley, increase it uh, in a, in a two point zero uh, uh, um, form, and we are using we are using this as a blueprint for uh, rollout. This is a picture, uh, this is a graph Bart already showed. Europe consists not only of countries, but also of regions. And uh, especially DG region thinks in regions. And here you can see, I think there are 52 or 62 regions. Um, of these regions, about half is already stepping into hydrogen in, in one way, shape or form, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we are a part of this uh, initiative. And, and as you can see, we are one of the initiating partners, the blue uh, uh, areas are uh, the partner, the, the founding organization together with uh, with Europe. It's the region of Aragon, the region of Aura, Auvergne, Rhône Alpes in, in France, the Normandy and our region in the north. And I can only say, try to become a member of that, try to get engaged, even for Israel, that is very important. Um, and here, this picture has been shown by Bart again, so it's the strength is in the repetition. We went from a regional hydrogen valley to a hydrogen valley which has a national impact in the Netherlands. And we think that together with the other hydrogen valleys in Europe uh, and in the world, I think there were 34 identified up until now, we can make this step. So this is our hydrogen valley in the Northern Netherlands. We are collaborating with Green Highland in Mallorca as a, an island hydrogen valley and with a big hit uh, project in um, in the Orkneys, and we want to reach out to other hydrogen valleys as well in, in, in the world. And there are several archetypes, as Bart already indicated, the small ones, medium scale, and the large ones. And actually, our project is actually in between two and three. But we also have, uh, let's say, a, a, a big uh, position in mobility. So you have to find out later on where is the best fit for your initiative. Uh, and the trick is, to always be open to other parties. If you cannot share, you cannot multiply. You have to do this together. We have to do this in a collaborative way. And what, what are we going to do uh, further on? Actually, this is again a graph uh, we borrowed from the Rural Burger Mission Innovation Fuel Cell Hydrogen Journal Maintainable Report. We want to positively answer to the request of President van der Leyen, who in the State of Union said, I want to see more hydrogen valleys. We want more of the same, but we also, also want to connect to other hydrogen valleys. That's why we reach out and we are trying to engage in a, in a cross-border development on that already. So we are quite progressed in that. And we are also looking for parties to join us because that's important. It's, it's a team effort. Then hydrogen needs to become a commodity and we want to focus far more far more on solely green hydrogen, because that is the only solution, the only way we can go to become fit for 55 and uh, answer the, the uh, next generation package in the Green Deal as the Commission has recently presented and will in the, in the second phase also be even further uh, deepened by the end of the year. Um, here is a view on the hydrogen valleys in Europe. As we can see it, there are even more. So it's very, it's not, 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 uh, not complete. And um, as you can see, we are here, our, our have a project, we collaborate with Big Hit and uh, the Mallorca, and we want to reach out to other regions. And what you can see here is, is a kind of a, a view on uh, where we can hit on additional funding. You can see the red line, the pinkish line and the blue line. These are three of the nine main transport corridors in Europe for heavy road transport. And we want to also adapt and act on that. Because if we want to spread the word on hydrogen, we need, for instance, uh, other hydrogen valleys, but also mobility is a very interesting connecting factor and road transport is a very hard to build sector. So having uh, use of the, the funding from Europe in, in the CEF call will help us get there. Um, and as you can see, there are many more uh, um, uh, hydrogen valleys. We are collaborating intensively with uh, the, norm, uh, the North German Highways for Future and the Danish Green Hydrogen uh, Hub, et cetera, and there are even more. So we are quite open to that. And having said that, um, 
I want to finish with, with, my, with my presentation. If you want further information, you can contact me. But of course, also Jürgen, uh, 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 Jürgen Dürenkamp, but also Racheli. And you will see me later on in the day to engage in discussions with you. And for now, this is what I would like to say. I hope it was clear enough. It was the first presentation after my holidays. Still, I'm still in the holidays, so I'm still in a relaxed mode. Um, and I would really uh, would like to say to the participants, enjoy it. This is a very, very interesting endeavor, the Common Hygiene Valley, and it's worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. You can stop sharing uh, the screen. There are some, there actually, there are many questions. Uh, I will not ask all the questions. Uh, we will do that later on during the day. I will ask just some, and then we move, move to the case. Um, Petr, a question from Laima. Patrick, how many years did it take to make your valley be active? I mean, all the parts accepting to work together. And how did you make it happen? Also, how did you make it happen to convince the people? Jochen, can you first open your uh, camera so that we can see you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay. Well, that's a trick of the trade, of course. Uh, um, um, it, this took us about five years in total, from the first, let's say, um, uh, mild uh, collaborations to, let's say, the, the, the application. Um, and how did we get the parties together? By convincing them, by be very, very clear that this is the only way to go. Uh, and, you know, you have big partners and small partners. Uh, it takes a lot of time, a lot of talking, a lot of explanation, a lot of finding the right path. Because when we started, we we wanted to become Archer Valley, but we didn't know exactly how. So it's also discussing with parties on what's your what's what can you bring to the table, what can we bring to the table? Where's the the integrated uh, 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 plus? How can we reach that? So in effect, it took five years, and it took let's say some. Um, first, we started with uh, development and mobility. Then we thought, okay, we need industry, so we need for industry to be interested in hydrogen, we need big production. Uh, big production means low price. But uh, for mobility, you don't need a big production, you need scale productions. If you have an, a refinery uh, that uses so much uh, hydrogen, uh, you can fuel a few thousand buses with that. But the buses are distributed over an area, so we found out a way to integrate all these um, several projects in becoming a integrated hydrogen value. So production, logistics, transport logistics, distribution logistics, connecting to fuel stations, which were there or on the development. Um, if you have a fuel station, there's no use having a fuel station without vehicles, so we needed the vehicles in. So, um, and again, the, the other one was the built environment where, for instance, the municipality of Hoogveen had the ambition of, be, of developing a hydrogen uh, hamlet, a, uh, an outskirt, which would, would be fully hydrogen based. So we, took a lot of time in defining and designing and refining the proposition. And it's actually about try to have an overview of all the projects in your region, try to see if they fit the mold of the hydrogen valley, see if they are green, because I know, uh, of course, you want to go fully green, but to go fully green is may maybe a bit difficult related to the cost. So probably you need to start with blue, but make it a um, a transition solution. Blue for the short term, green for the long term, integrated, fade in the blue, uh, fade in the green, fade out the blue. So these kinds of actions you need to do. It's, it's, so it's really difficult to explain it in, a, in, a, in, a, in an extended elevator pitch, how it really works. It, 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 but it really starts with ambition and tenacity. And then uh, the logic will will come forward itself because everybody knows something is going on with the climate. I think everybody knows we need to do something, and and I think most people also know that we need to step out of fossil and step into renewables. And hydrogen is the only solution to that because it's the only climate efficient solution we have to tackle this tremendous uh, challenge and problem. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Another question. 
from Shelley. Uh, Patrick, regarding the, po the ports, I guess in the Netherlands, people see the ports as primarily industrial and commercial, and the use of ports uh, for gas transport via ships or ocean-based pipelines is generally accepted as business as usual. And that the idea of replacing natural gas with hydrogen and or ammonia is considered environmentally positive. For ecological sensitive ports where there are coral reefs and, lot, and a lot of tourism, how can we safely and environmentally friendly involve them in a hydrogen valley without causing any risk to these sensitive concerns? Yeah, well, that is that these are uh, many questions uh, put in one question. Mm -hmm. uh, if we look at our region as an example, we are located uh, alongside the largest uh, natural reserve in Europe, the International Wallet Sea, which goes from Den Helder in the south and in the, in the western part of the Netherlands to Esbjerg, halfway Denmark. It's the largest connected nature reserve. Um, and um, of course, you um, you need to find a balance between ecology and economy. But it starts really with understanding what, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. I think from the, from the nature reserve side, uh, you want to have as less um, impact in the, uh, as less, let's say, um, industrial uh, activities in the region uh, affect, affecting, let's say, the quality of the, of, of, the, of the environment. On the other side, you need to do something, otherwise, uh, you cannot maintain your econo economic position. So it's it's a balance. And I think it starts with clear uh, descriptions on what is acceptable and what's not acceptable and find a solution for that. Uh, of course, you know, if you want to bring in, let's say, um, liquid hydrogen from somewhere with a ship, I think it makes sense to not have the ship running on heavy fuel oil. Uh, so these kinds of, these kinds of, uh, solutions you must bring to the table uh, immediately so uh, investors know that they need to make steps to bring the energy but bring it in a clean way so these are all the the ex the aspects uh, which, which which can be there and it's we entice this this challenge here as well because of this this big nature reserve nature reserve needs to be passed with power cables and the gas pipelines uh, so it, it it is seeking for a joint solution which minimizes the effect on the nature reserve, but does not impact the um, proposition, the green proposition you want to uh, uh, develop in, in a negative way. It's, it's finding a, a joint solution. And of course, uh, reefs are very sensible, but I think if, we, if, if you put your heads together, there is a solution to be found. May not be easy, but you need to find a solution. It's a complex puzzle. Thank you. Two more questions. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on the heavens budget? Uh, 20 million euros came from the European Commission via the Horizon 2020 SHTU, but the complete budget is about 100 million euros. Where did the 80 million non-EU money mainly come from? Well, um, as Bart indicated, this is a public-private activity. So yeah. governments, re local, regional, national, and international, team up with the private sector industries, mobility uh, industry, built environment, et cetera. We received, uh, let's say, a contribution from the EU from uh, uh, at 20 million euros on a project volume of about 80 million euros. And the, the project volume is increasing because, you know, economy grows, uh, uh, products get more expensive uh, because of demand. And it's actually going up to 100 million euros, more or less, more or less. But we also made a deal with the region. The region came out with a 10 million euro contribution on top of the 20, and the state will contribute uh, 10 million euros on top of that as well. So the remainder, the balance, that's in the, the 60 million euros, which will mean are coming from the private sector. And of course, this is not everything. We also are looking into fiscal schemes to make, let's say, the, the effort for the, for the companies uh, um, less uh, less intensive. We are looking for other subsidy arrangements to support them in any way, shape, or form. So actually, we we will get um, um, I hope to get to a 40, 50 percent, let's say, uh, uh, contribution from let's say uh, support mechanisms uh, to uh, to make this happen. And as Bart said, this is not easy. This is a 
This is something which gives me, gives me gray hair sometimes, as you can see. I was very, very blonde at the beginning, now I'm quite gray. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, uh, th this can be done. It's about convincing, creating a business case. And the business case parties present at the start of a project will differ in time. So be flexible and adjust and refine and explain that, okay, this has gone more expensive, so we need some more help with that. And this is going better, so we need less help on that. That's, that's, that's the collaborative effort. So it's a private, public, joint uh, proposal. So we're in, in it together because industry wants to go decarbonized and society wants to go decarbonized. So we have to team up. And in the end, we hope to make it as such that it will be more competitive, cost competitive, and even in parity with fossil fuels in the end. That's the goal. Perfect. Last question. This is also in line with the case, uh, actually an important aspect, the geography, the specific geography. Uh, Kabanga is asking, what is the land size of the Northern Netherlands hydrogen valley? The land size? Yes. Um, the Northern Netherlands, so the three provinces, Friesland, Groningen, and Drenthe, are approximately one quarter of the land mass of the area of the Netherlands. So that is the size of our hydrogen valley. And within that, uh, there is a, let's say, a, a core region, the province of Groningen and Drenthe, which is about, let's say, that would be, I think, 15% of the land mass of the Netherlands. Uh, so that would be an indication on the, the the size of the area compared to the Netherlands total area. Okay, and uh, I, I believe you can uh, drive through the, the the northern Netherlands hydrogen valley in just a few hours, right? Yeah. Well, actually, you, uh, you always use the explanation. If you want to see our hydrogen valley, you step in the car and you drive through it in an afternoon, and you will see all the elements of the green hydrogen valley chain mm -hmm. already realized or under development from let's say all the aspects, including the education and research activities, etc. Exactly, good. Thank you very much, Patrick, for your presentation. Um, you will join us uh, later today. Um, we're going to work on the case, and um, after the case, I, I assume many questions will arise. These questions will be uh, uh, asked to you. Mm -hmm. and so we'll see you back at the end of the afternoon. Please stay with us while uh, explaining the case. Yep. Um, to all others, uh, I will explain the cases will take about 10 minutes. After that, we have a 10 to 15 minute break. Then you will be divided in breakout rooms. And then you're going to work on the case. You can take a short break in the meantime, but afterwards there's another break. Okay, let me go to the case. Okay, the case exists of uh, actually eight steps you have to fulfill. Uh, I've sent you the case and the score sheets. Uh, each some of the steps are more important, therefore you can um, receive more points. Um, it's a bit of cliche, but it's not all about points. It's mainly about uh, thinking of how to develop this hydrogen value chain with your group. The group um, you're in will be uh, of five people. You have a group of five people. You work on the case for one hour and 45 minutes. The first uh, step is the location. And as Uwe mentioned, uh, Uwe from Roland Berger mentioned yesterday, this is one of the most important aspects of developing a hydrogen valley chain. A hydrogen valley, sorry. The location must cover a specific geography. Their footprint can range from a local or regional focus, for example, a major port and its hinterlands, to a specific national or international region, such as the Northern Netherlands. It may also be a city, and as we normally say, and as Patrick just said, you should be able to drive through this valley in just a few hours. So it should be covered and should not be too large. The case has a link to a map with all hydrogen valleys in the world for your inspiration. If there are any questions about this, please send ask the questions in the chat and I will come back to it before we start. Seconds. Choose a focus for your hydrogen valley depending on the location you chose. You can take one of the archetypes <clears throat> as a guideline. These archetypes have, have been mentioned by both Bart and by uh, Patrick. And they're also mentioned in the report on page 27 and 28. 
three archetypal value chain uh, setups are representative of the current project landscape. You don't have to choose one archetype, you can differentiate from it. Uh, as Patrick just said, for example, the Heaven project is a combination of actually archetype two and three. So you don't have to stick to one, you can make a mix. It's just for you to have a, to have a focus, uh, a guideline to help you think about the local assets and the local needs. Also, if you have any questions, please ask them in the chat. Okay, number three, make sure you cover multiple steps of the value chain from hydrogen production to steroid storage, transport, and offtake. Offtake also known as end use. As uh, Bart Bibayuk just said, make sure it's a sector integration. Also in line with what Patrick just said about the Heaven Project, it's not just about one, part of this value chain, make sure you develop several parts of this value chain. In other words, when developing a hydrogen valley, the focus cannot just be on one part of the value chain. You must develop multiple steps and describe on which you will focus. For more information, go to page 19 and 30, 30 of the report. Step four, what to do with this hydrogen, uh, which is what to do with the hydrogen. As Uwe said yesterday, the off-takers are key. Depending on your location and archetype, define the end users, such as mobility, industry, for example, for steel production, the built environment, for example, for heating, and energy uses, for example, data centers. Some detail and every um, and make a, a distinction between these end uses because also these end uses have different sectors. Uh, for example, mobility is not just mobility. Please uh, mention uh, on which part of the mobility sector you focus. For example, aviation, shipping, land transport, all of them. This is up to you, but make a short distinction. For more information, go to page 24. Step five. You cannot build a hydrogen valley on your own. Make a list of partners and stakeholders involved. Think about partners and stakeholders from both the industry, SMEs, so the small business, academia, and the government, of course, that are located in or are connected strongly to your valley. Number six, uh, a difficult one. Make your hydrogen valley a success. Uh, the report describes five key success factors. Briefly describe how you meet at least three of them to make sure your hydrogen valley is successful. For more information, and I think this needs some reading, go to page 30 to 36. Number seven, sustaining your hydrogen valley project. As Patrick just said, if you build something, you have to maintain it. Describe what next steps you take to keep it successful. Think about the next step. Think about the next steps and describe these briefly. Uh, Bart also mentioned, for example, education. For more information about this subject, go to page 29 till 36. And the last step, we have now discussed and described all the success factors but as in any other project, there are also threats and barriers. Describe your main barriers to develop a hydrogen valley and how you will overcome them. The most common barriers are mentioned also in the report and are mentioned on page 36 to 42. In other words, your hydrogen valley must meet the four common characteristics of what constitutes a hydrogen valley a clearly defined geographic, geographic scope, a well-defined and justifiable skill, broad value chain coverage, and supply to various end uses or off-takers. Last but not least, it is challenging to answer all questions in just one hour and 45 minutes in full detail. So don't be too hard on yourself. There's no good or wrong. And please try to work on the case on your own way. The thinking and discussion with your group is much more important than just one right answer. Uh, nevertheless, if part of the question is unclear, you can ask me or uh, while even while you're in the breakout room for help. But hold back 
where possible. And we now have a 15 minutes technical break. We return at 10.30 Dutch time, 11.30 Israeli time. And during this break, we make the last preparation to the breakout rooms. And probably when you return, you are already in the breakout room with your Joachim, can I ask one really um, specific question? Are you expecting yes, all the people in the group to agree on one uh, program or is each person writing their own separate things and sharing ideas together? Yes, like it's very, very good question. Thank you. Um, agree on one. And that is challenging, especially with the different backgrounds uh, in your group. Uh, we have many nationalities and every uh, group has different nationalities. So it's not just a group of Israeli people or Dutch people. Um, so you must agree on one, uh, on one uh, location and, on, and you do the case together. Uh, as I said, this can be challenging because for somebody from the Netherlands, it it's, might be hard to imagine um, the Israeli landscape. Um, if so, you can also make a short distinction uh, within your group on where um, the other teammates are focusing on, also because of the time. Is that an answer to your question? Yes. yes. Adding, by just adding to this, because the majority in a given group can be comprised of Israelis, this does not mean that we have to focus on Israeli uh, geographic locations. No. Maybe you just start with the introduction and you not only introduce yourself to your group members, but you also tell a little bit about the strength in your region, okay, that you can bring to the table while you are going to address the, uh, the assignment. Good addition. So does it mean that each of us are like stakeholders, like theoretically stakeholders in the, in the, in the valley? Uh, you can make that um, distinction, but uh, actually, I think you have to work uh, all together on the group, and there's not one role within your group. Think about it together, please. Uh, may, may I ask uh, technically uh, how a group shall uh, provide its, uh, its work? Uh, shall we nominate uh, uh, one person to write down the, the results or everybody is writing uh, a different uh, uh, scope. Uh, how do you organize? It? Yes, thank you, Eli. I was just going to address that part. Um, it would be nice if uh, there's one a chairman of the group, a spokesman, uh, also for later today, when we're going to discuss the, uh, the, the case, some questions might be asked and then the spokesman can answer this question. The way it's been uh, um, handed in is via documents. Uh, so you send the document to us, please, before a six o'clock Dutch time, um, that's seven o'clock Israeli time, then we have the time to review it uh, during night and feedback will be provided tomorrow. So um, fill in your answers and your thoughts uh, in on the document. Thanks. Then Eran asking in the chat um, whether the whole of Israel can be one valley. It's only 300 kilometers. Almost the same goes for the Netherlands. Uh, technically, yes, uh, this can be a valley, but please uh, be a bit more specific. Any other questions? I just want to emphasize once more the issue of the assignment. So we're expecting to receive one written assignment. You will uh, introduce the different uh, group members that uh, worked on this assignment, but there will be one, uh, one uh, written document uh, on which you all agree. Yes. I understand it's not allowed to be on a region that's already have a region. No, thank you, Willem, no. So don't copy paste um, a, a project, please. Also, therefore, have a look at the map. Um, there's a link in the reports with the hydrogen valleys that already that are already existing. So don't yeah. please copy paste or uh, choose the same location. No. Okay, we um, have a break until 10.30 Dutch time, 11.30 Israeli time. And then we return in our breakout rooms. Thank you. Thank you.
come by uh, your group uh, to see if there are any questions as well. But since there are 19 groups, it might take a while before we are in your group. Good luck. אני לא שמעתי אותם. אני לא שמעתי אותם מדברים, אני בתוך הצד השני. יש פה כמה דברים. את יכולה להצטרף אבל את רוצה להצטרף דרך זה אוקיי, אז תוציא אותי, אני עושה leave room אוקיי, את צריכה לבוא למחשב הזה אין שום בעיה לבחור חדר, להגיד לי לאיזה חדר לצרף אותך, לחזור למקום ואז אני אצטרף אותך אני לא חדר לשבת פה? אה, אתה רוצה מפה, אין בעיה את יכולה לבוא מפה, לא? לא, אני מבינה, תצרף אותי בבקשה כל פעם לחדר, שים אותי בחדר שתיים בבקשה אני גם לא שומעת את יוחם כלומר
Hello? Can somebody hear me? Yes, thank you. Only us now in the Should we have a cup of coffee earlier? Mm -hmm. No? You already have too much? Uh, yeah. If you have coffee, don't give it to Katrina. She will steal it all. <laughs> it was true. All Katrina did. Always have coffee for my box. Precious box. Uh -huh. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And that's what you start acquiring. Yeah, that's uh, the idea, I think. Marcella seemed to be positive about it. Yeah.
we inderdaad eerder zouden beginnen. Uh, what do you want by phone or?
הם גם נורא התקדמו, מה? כן, לא, עכשיו אני רוצה לנוח. ואז יש הפסקה, ואז השאלה אם אנחנו חוזרים ב-13:30 או ב-13:45. בכל מקרה יש לנו הפסקה. ערך אלי. היי. אני ביקרתי כמה I was very impressed with the um, group number 10, with group number 9 that want to do something in Singapore. Yeah. Uh, other people that were working well were 5, 6, 7, and uh, 19. Yeah. I took notes. Um, How is group 8 doing? Group 8, let me see. They were talking, uh, they were still talking about different locations. And yeah. uh, at the time, I didn't see that they made progress. No. You want me to visit them? I noticed that too. Uh, I visited only the oh, yeah. 11, but I saw they were struggling a bit. Okay, I can go back into number eight. Uh, okay, okay, I'm going to visit uh, group number eight. Wait one minute, please. Can we first okay. discuss um, the details of um, the end of today? So, yeah. Um, let me see. We end at quarter past one Israeli time. Like now we end at quarter past one. We end now at one o'clock. We have 22 more minutes. No, based on the program we have. I know. Uh, but um, in the top bottom, at the top um, corner, it says uh, 22 more minutes. And that, that's also, I send them a message. You have 30 more, more, 30 more minutes. Uh, I did not see that, so I didn't know that. Okay. But that's fine because we go to the break at a quarter past, and then we have a 30-minute break. And then we're right on schedule again. I understand. Okay. Um, we call all of them back into the room. And then we say, we go for a break for 30 minutes. And after the break, um, you will be interviewing um, the participants and uh, ask some questions to the spoke person, uh, and then consult with Patrick and ask for his experience or his um, well, response. Is that right? Yeah, so what I suggest that now they have another 20 minutes that they will prepare their pitch, okay? But we did not agree on the pitch, right? No, but now that they have gone through the entire exercise, they can now make a short pitch. Otherwise, we're going to have long discussions of one group. That's not what we want. Um, but, OK, how far are they? Are, are most of them finishing the case at this moment? Um, I don't know. Look, I started at 1137. Uh, so I don't know about group number two. They were still doing the intro at the time. But what we can say now is that we uh, suggest that they will devote the next, let's say, 10, 15 minutes to making a pitch and not necessarily. Most of the groups who are more advanced are now uh, working on the assignment, the written assignment. Okay. Um, but when do they do this pitch? I think that they need the pitch to be ready because during this part that we will have the plenary discussion, in the presence of Patrick, <clears throat> if we would like them to say something, then it has to be very uh, concerted. In any case, they have to summarize it in the pitch. Okay. Um. The means, the location, the archetype, the sectors, there's, you know, just a few uh, uh, points. Yeah, but not all of them can, um can pitch, so uh, maybe we should ask then people who are finalizing the case can prepare a pitch, and those who are not finalized yet don't have to do it. So only those groups that are finalizing can do a pitch. Mm, yeah, I just don't like the formulation of this because it's it feels as if you're lagging behind. So what I think is that we can offer this as an opportunity 
Um, if you feel that you're ready, then you can start working on your pitch. If not, then continue working on the assignment. On okay, just to okay. say it. Stop. Okay. And do you want to? Do that? Mm -hmm. We can broadcast a message to all of them if you want. I see in the break rooms. Yeah. Breakout room. Will you do that? Yeah, I will. And um, uh, then you will ask those. Um, groups that are uh, that have a pitch to pitch, and then uh, Patrick provides feedback on it. Yeah, I think that's good. I think that we should have one group from Israel, one group from Morocco, one from Dubai, one from Singapore, and one from um, Abu Dhabi. Okay. That means, in other words, I do not want to see multiple groups from Israel pitch. Um, no. Okay. Let, let maybe send the message out now because then they have time to prepare it. Yeah. I will join this group number. Which one did you say? Group number ten. Let me see. For a second, and then we'll meet again. I will join the uh, main room again. Okay, fine. See you in a bit. Yeah. Bye bye. Okay. Good morning.
último que le vamos a dar, el señor va a dar otra cosa. כמה אנשים השתתפו בדרי רן? בדבר הזה עכשיו? למה קרה מבחינה טכנית שחלק מהאנשים עפו מהקבוצות שלהם? הם יצאו לבד. וההוא שהלכה לו בטריה, אז הוא אומר שהוא יוצא ו... זה נראה. טוב, אני אתחשר ליוחנן, אני אשאל אותו אם הוא הודיע לו. אה. יוחנן? יוחם? חלי? היי. תגיד לאנשים שאנחנו עכשיו נכנסים? כן, שתי מיניות, נכון? כן, אז אני לא ראיתי את המסגרת שאתה נכנסת. אה, אני ראיתי, אז אולי זה לא נכנס לך. אה, אז אני לא ראיתי את המסגרת שאתה נכנסת. אה, אז אני לא ראיתי את המסגרת שאתה נכנסת. כן, אבל... אוקיי, אני לא יודע למה, אבל... Four more minutes, I will say. Okay, did you get the message now? Ah, okay. Um, tell me, I understand that there are, one second, <clears throat> two, three, five, that there are five different regions that were chosen, the um, geographical regions. Which ones do you have? Um. I don't know. I I have I don't know to be honest. Ah, okay. So I um, so it could be that I have the information in more detail because I took notes in every group. Yes, and I didn't. Okay. So what uh, what I will then do when we start? Uh, Rega, did you also tell them that they can pitch or that they can prepare their pitch? I I I send them this message. If you have time, please prepare a short pitch. If not, please keep on working on the case. Okay, that's great. So I didn't see that. No problem. So no. the regions that we have, yeah, regions that we have are Spain, Israel, wait, wait, Singapore, wait. Yeah. Dubai, Morocco. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a nice distinction that you made. So uh, we're going to work on. We're going to ask this these five groups to have a short pitch. I, I will choose the specific groups I'd like to present, okay? I also have their names, their numbers. Okay, good. I think we have to be very specific to them. Five groups, and they, their pitch should only be a few minutes. Let's say about three minutes. No, one minute. It, look, we do these things with these uh, Dutch startups that pitch to Israeli and Dutch venture capital, okay? And we give them two minutes in order to pitch for a half a million to two million euros. So we should not give them more than one minute so that we can start. Now, if it's a good story, it can be short, right? Yeah, but the bad stories is, uh, is not good for us at the moment. Good, so two minutes each. So then, um, okay, 10 minutes. And then after every pitch, um, there will be a short discussion um, between the group, you and Patrick. Yeah. I think that uh, after the pitch, then Patrick can relate, okay? That uh, let only Patrick relate. Yes, but I think you can ask the question to Patrick if needed. Okay, no problem. Like an interviewer. Okay, I will uh, call Patrick now to inform him about these five countries. All right. And Rega, um, so uh, in one minute, I see the breakout rooms will cease from existing, and then you tell them that we have lunch till a quarter to two, right? Israeli time. What? Okay. Quarter to two, indeed. 30.45. And okay. um, um, do you know the group numbers? Um, yes, I have the group numbers. The, do the people know the group numbers? Uh, oh, that's a good question. My God, let me look. Shish. Okay, I, I know who I have for Israel, and that's the only country for which there are several. Okay. Okay, and okay, then so um, manage with that as well. Which which one is that? 
That is group number six at the moment. Shall I prepare them, Racheli, saying that uh, the group working on the case in Spain, Israel, Singapore, Dubai, and Morocco will be asked to give a very short pitch of a maximum of two minutes. Then we. Um, Sixteen uh, seconds. Which uh, group six is the group Kabanga and Liat? Oh, we have 100. Keep them open, keep them open for me. Tarelli, Mr. Esser, Mia Shahar, Amir Sarid, Ali or Khabib, Tarelli, Hameshesre, Hameshesre, Tim Avert. Okay, okay, so I, I have the names. Tarelli, open the chess book. Ah, the Korbrahi, Embaya. Uh, Benjamin. Okay, and by so I know the representatives of these groups. Okay. I'd let you do this talk, uh, Racheli. I will. Okay. Let you... okay. okay. Yeah. So we can close all the rooms so that we can go to lunch, uh, and we're going to meet now, right? Oh, it's it's just 130 seconds. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Recording in progress. Thank you. Okay. Is everyone back in the main room? Uh, no, I see 25 people. <clears throat> uh, I just have one question, uh, Rekeli. Yeah. Do we, uh, we have finished the assignment, so do we need, do I need to, to email it to you, or how should we do it? Yeah. One second, I will I will relate to that as well. Okay. Yeah. Let me just wait for people to come back. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Shlechi, please send a WhatsApp message that others will join as well because they probably thought that the break started. Okay, second, I'll do that. Okay. Okay, there are 69 people. I understand I got the break rooms. The breakout rooms are not acting anymore. Is it okay? Are the breakout rooms closed? Yes. Okay, great. So first of all, thank you so much for taking active part at this hands-on session. This is also for Jochem and myself, the first time that we do this. We learned a lot through um, your experience and uh, we will share later on the experience in more detail. Um, shortly, we will have a lunch break, and therefore I do not want to take any additional time, just mentioning uh, two things. One is in the chat, you have a message uh, with the email addresses of both Jochem and myself, uh, to which you will send your written assignment. That is one thing. And as a preparation for the discussion that we will have after the lunch, which will start at a quarter to two Israeli time or quarter to one, Dutch time or Central European time, we kindly asked the representatives of the following groups to make a short pitch. We recommend that the pitch will be no longer than one minute, 60 seconds, so that you really confine everything that you've learned in those 60 minutes, uh, 60 seconds, sorry. The groups that we have chosen are the group uh, number eight of Nicole on Spain, 
the group of Iran Berkovich and uh, Benjamin, uh, number six on Israel, the group of Tim Moyman, um, number nine on Singapore, the group of Leo Khaviv, group number 10 on Dubai, and the group of Tim Evert, uh, number 15 on Morocco. So um, we would expect each of you to have a very short pitch uh, for no longer than one minute, which will then be presented um, in the plenary that we will have after lunch. And each pitch will be discussed in the presence of Patrick Knoeben, the architect of heaven, and uh, we will all learn from this. <laughs> Thank you and enjoy your lunch.
Good afternoon. So I'm Tovim Yumidach. I hope you had some time to, uh, to eat or at least work while eating um, or eat while working. I'm very pleased to see all of you back. This has been a, a fantastic breakout session in which we all learned a lot. What we're going to do in the next hour and a quarter, we're going to have um, five very short presentations, what we call pitches. And uh, these pitches are going to represent uh, to Patrick, who's again with us. Thanks, Patrick, for joining. Yes. They're going to present hydrogen valleys designed by um, the international experts um, on five regions. The regions um, that we will hear about are Israel, Morocco, Singapore, Dubai, and um, and Spain. And actually, I remember now there is another region uh, which is in Istanbul in Turkey. And if the person who worked on Istanbul can send you or myself a private message, then we will include you as well. So our plan is that a one representative of uh, each of these six group groups, sorry, will make a short pitch. And after every pitch, Patrick will interact with the, uh, or Patrick will provide feedback in, to the um, um, thinking exercise carried out by the uh, group members. So with your permission, um, I would like to start with group number eight, uh, in which Nicole Vermeulen from Shell uh, was a uh, participant and they focused on Spain. Can someone from the group that worked on Spain um, unmute herself or himself so that we can uh, hear you? Uh, yeah, sure. So this is uh, Nicole. Hi. And uh, I work together uh, with my three colleagues on this, uh, with Suzanne, uh, Mario, and uh, Sing. And um, shall I start presenting about uh, Spain? Yes, you have uh, one minute. So I'll try to keep it short. Well, first of all, uh, I want to say I really appreciate this. And it was also nice to work together with such a diff different backgrounds. Uh, so that being said, we chose um, for the location in, uh, in the south of Spain, so the port of Cadiz. And the reason for that being is that we wanted to target it in Europe uh, because the EU funding is there in place and there's a strong uh, government support, which I think uh, will, will help us uh, to really uh, make, materialize this. And then we thought this is the fourth uh, largest port of Spain. Um, and there's a high abundance of uh, renewable feedstock in place, so mainly uh, solar, but also wind, which, uh, which will help us, of course, the availability of water. And then aside from that, uh, we looked in the value chain that we will have uh, uh, different uh, off takers in place there. And we're mainly going to look at the chemical industry there. So for example, ammonia, which can later also be used as fertilizers in the, in the farming, but methanol refinery and, uh, and steel plants could be other options. Um, furthermore, there is uh, a strong work with the rest of Europe. Maybe we want to expand later on to export. And there's also already an existing uh, pipeline infrastructure uh, for LNG, which we would be able to use. So that means we have chosen for a medium scale uh, archetype. Uh, I have to keep it short. So just jumping to the partners and stakeholders that will be key, I think, to make this finally a success. So we need to be sure that we are engaged with all the parties here uh, that, that uh, will, will be a crucial factor. And most importantly, with the government and to get to get the right government uh, support there, as well as with uh, with the local community. So try to to summarize it within the one minute. Uh, let me know if there's any questions or elaborations uh, required. Thank you, Nicole and uh, Patrick. Um, if you can please analyze and relate to the presentation of the group that worked on Spain. Okay, uh, yeah, we'll certainly do so. Uh, I think I will have some more than the pitch of uh, Nicole, <laughs> some more time. Uh, I really enjoyed it. It was, it, was, it was very, very brief, very condensed, and congratulations to that. That's always uh, hard to do in the, in the, in the, on the short notice. Um, to recap, uh, Cadiz, um, fourth largest port in Spain, indeed, availability of wind in the, in the Andalusian, uh, Andalusian landscaping, uh, solar, of course, uh, also there. Uh, off takers chemical, no mobility off takers I hear, but um, that can come uh, later. I think a strong point is that you um, um, started from the um, the government support side. Indeed, the EU is very much advocating 
um, hydrogen, hydrogen fans as well, as Bar this morning explained, but also there are, are other funding mechanisms available in Europe as well. So that's a very strong point. And indeed, the Spanish government, uh, Gobierno de Español, has uh, put in place a very strong support mechanism in addition to the European funding. So that's good. There are some very strong uh, associations in Spain, like the Fundación, Fundación Hidrogeno de Aragón, and of course the Spanish Hydrogen Association. So that would be interesting to get them in as well to create um, uh, sufficient support from all the relevant sides, of course. I think the port setting is excellent. Uh, if you have a port, you have a, have a logical infrastructure starting or ending point. It is connected to uh, to a. I think it's a, it's a quite a large chemical industry there. I wasn't I wasn't aware of the methanol production, but the ammonia is is indeed uh, very interesting. Makes it tangible, makes it export ready. The availability of existing pipeline infrastructure uh, following this one of the LNG terminals, one of the eight I think in Spain, is a very good idea. You could even think about creating a hydrogen ready LNG facility. Because you, you can then transport the, the hydrogen via gas or cryogenic or other forms which which fit um, besides the ammonia. So I think that's a very good one. Nicole, have you have you already, in some way, shape, or form, made made an estimate on an investment magnitude for this endeavor? Just well, what? it's a good question. So I think when we discussed briefly how what what size we would make it. So I think our initial. Uh, thought was to make it 500 megawatts in a couple of years. So we think that's uh, something that will be feasible. So it's not like a huge investment. If I would estimate that it's probably going to be around 1 billion. Um, but uh, so that, that would be the intent. But we didn't uh, work this much through, but that is uh, the first headlines. So. Yeah, I, I get that. I think 500 megawatts is a very nice size. And then you can also have the rule of thumb of 1 million per megawatt just, just to have a figure in place. And think about. I would certainly also think about um, the not only the let's say the energy logistics, pipelines, etc., but also the transport logistics because uh, Cadiz and the south of Spain is also connected to the. Um, I think that's the. Um, it's called the Côte Atlantique, uh, main transport corridor in Europe. It starts in Rotterdam and then goes through Belgium, France, and then goes two ways, uh, left and right side of the Pyrenees uh, down to uh, Cadiz and the uh, Gibraltar region. Mm -hmm. So that would give you an, uh, an extra off takers market because you have long haul transport. Yes. A lot of trucks, a lot of trucks go to Gibraltar or to Cadiz to, to make the jump to uh, to Morocco. So that, I think that's a, I think it's an excellent position. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm quite enthusiastic about that. So uh, I would say uh, keep on, keep on, uh, investigating what's happening and i think one of the first steps i would take is get around the table with the regional government of uh, i think this is andalusia uh, and uh, the national government because they have from the top of my head i think they are they have a, an enormous hygiene support program in uh, under preparation at this moment so uh, very good yeah Thanks. yeah very good. yep Thank you so much, Nicole, Thank for you. being first and uh, setting the scene for the others. <laughs> the next group I'd like to invite is uh, the group that worked on Singapore. Uh, I kindly ask uh, the representative uh, of that group, maybe Tim Moiman, uh, to present the uh, work you did on Singapore. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Tim. <clears throat> and I can uh, tell you uh, about uh, our project in Singapore. I will try to share my screen if possible. Is that possible, Raquel, you think? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay, can everybody see my screen here? Yes. Okay, We our project is about Singapore, uh, Hydrogen Valley. Um, as you can see here, Singapore, and we focused on uh, Singapore uh, as the region, but our location for the hydrogen project is a place called Jurong Island, as you can see here. Jurong Island is a very mostly industrialized island uh, with several ports and also several ports in the neighborhood where we can place our uh, uh, 
hydrogen uh, electrolysis um, uh, company. Um, our off-takers will be, uh, for a large part, uh, the local industry, being refineries, uh, chemical uh, uh, companies, uh, but also a large industry which probably needs some heat. Uh, but also uh, the, the the town of Singapore. There's lots of commercial large buildings and also um, uh, residential buildings. Another offtaker for us will be uh, transport, but we're focusing on the heavy duty transport and buses. Uh, we think local uh, transport by car is usually covered by Tesla's, they'll, they'll manage the, the short distances here. Um, and uh, so our focus on those offtakers brings us to the archetype two for now, but later on, we are looking into uh, archetype three because we are also see opportunities to export our hydrogen um, through existing infrastructure. For example, pipelines going to Indonesia, uh, but also further on in neighboring countries like, um, I thought it was Malaysia and maybe Japan even to export our products. We can import our, um, uh, what you call it, our electricity for production from also existing importing infrastructure for green uh, electricity from um, neighboring countries and maybe in the future, even Australia. Strong points in this um, uh, development are that there is a very, very solid uh, business environment in Singapore the government is very willing to support and to fund um, uh, projects like this because it's uh, very uh, low t uh, TLR, so it's not really developed yet. And Singapore is very keen on uh, supporting this and they're very keen on funding green projects. So that's a very good combination. Um, let's see another strong point is, is of course the existing structure. Um, um, and very important stakeholders are, uh, of course, the local governments, but also the local industry, all the parties that are here on this island, and also maybe for the future, the neighboring countries. And we want to really uh, be uh, on the table, around the table with the local government and the regulators, because one of the uh, things we, potential barriers we can see is the the new um, what you call it uh, image it has hydrogen, and maybe uh, local government uh, might see it as a uh, potential danger being a gas and maybe explosive. So we really need to be on the table, around the table with regulators in an early stage. Um, this is I think so far our project, yes. and we really have a, a good catchy name we also thought of catchy name already so it's a uh, hydro sing from singapore of course amazing yeah so um if um if patrick if you can relate to uh, singapore and um, as i work as innovation attache in israel um, i work for the dutch government of course but uh, we often relate singapore and israel so maybe this is also of interest to the israeli participants of because of the size and the the, um, the uh, innovation that exists in Singapore. So maybe we in Israel can learn something from the model that will now be uh, evaluated by uh, by Patrick to see the similarities uh, and yeah. where we can learn from each other. Patrick. Well, yeah, yeah. thank you for, uh, thank you Tim for this, uh, this very brief and extensive uh, explanation. Um, I like it because you, you not only create a hydro valley, but you create it in an island setting. So hit two, uh, two uh, flies in one uh, hit. Oh, yeah. don't, don't know if this, that's the right English uh, uh, typology, but um, I think it's, it's very good. You also looked into, let's say, support from the government, local, regional. Singapore has some, I think, some challenges with air quality. So that's a, that's a definitely a hit. It has, as far as I know, on this island, um, 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 uh, there is in the, indeed a big, big industry. I think there is even an LNG port terminal around there or it's the other side there's a lot of traffic going to the Singapore Strait and one of yeah. the busiest uh, sea straits in the world 
Um, you hit the refineries, the industry, the off takers. Uh, there is a logic to that because, in general, they and the same goes for the for the Cadiz case. There probably is already indigenous hydrogen production there from natural gas, probably. So you can can feed on that because that's yep. a that's a good ask. The transport is excellent, heavy duty, and buses. But you you, you could also consider the ferries. Uh, because there are a lot of ferry ferry um, uh, passaging uh, around, around that region, and they in general use heavy fuel oil or fuel oil, which is isn't too beneficial, of course, for the public health. And hitting the ferries gives you an instant hit together with the buses and the heavy transport. Yeah. So on on that, and of course Singapore has an excellent position in, in that, as as a as a as a as a as a, as a roundabout to import export to Japan uh, get get. Let's say the uh, the the, uh, the power from neighboring countries, where there is may, may be an abundance or an, or a uh, shortage, actually to to connect it, which we do in Europe, for instance, we we put in interconnectors in, in into the water, the high voltage direct current interconnectors. That would, could be a very interesting case here because of Singapore. It, it, it's enormous. It's yeah. not a re, it's not a small town. You know, it's it's a it's a metropole, and uh, and with that goes the enormous energy consumption, also related to the buildings that that's excellent i'm not familiar with if how the energy gets into the buildings and i'm not aware of the, if they have a nat natural gas grid there providing the but that's something to for you to consider because then you would even could could create some some speed yeah. in that yeah um, to some extent yeah the regulators excellent because you have to explain that hydrogen is safe it is safe used all over the world in, on a day-to-day -day basis in nothing is eight billion eight bcm per year germany 12 so uh, and that's always going on without accidents but you still need to explain that something is uh, floating along that it's not a driving bomb or so that's yeah. very important just to take away the hesitation i know from singapore from there i think nicole may, may also know that uh, they've been engaged very heavily in, in an lng terminal uh, as an lng position so they have already vast experience on the regulatory domain with handling these, let's say, um, uh, typical uh, uh, um, um, commodities. So I think it's, it's a very good one. And did you also have an, have an idea on the investment magnitude already? No, no not, not really, but uh, we, we hadn't had a chance to look into the, the scale you would need mm -hmm. for um, yeah. probable, yes. Yeah, I think, I think looking at, for instance, what Cadiz did, a 500 megawatt scale is a very interesting scale. Okay. And, so put, and think about if we go along several hydrogen valleys in the world and you have 500 megawatt types, then you could also create some strength in uh, in joint development because it would, it would be a bit sad if one would create a 100 megawatt electrolyzer, one gigawatt and then 300 and four, make it a yeah. unit, make it a unit size. 500 seems a typical size more or less, but I like it, really good. And especially, you know, Dajin Valley in an island and take the island to connect it to um, to this very big metropole with its typical challenges like air quality, yes. but it's also it, it is already a fuel hub, of course. So uh, yeah, uh, oh, very good, interesting, very interesting, really. And the name is super hydro <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tim, and thank you, Patrick, for your feedback. The next group I'd like to invite is a group that focuses on Israel, and uh, Iran uh, will uh, make a short presentation. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'll try to make it short. Uh, can I show my screen? We don't see your screen yet. OK, so uh, can you see my screen? Yes. So these are uh, the group members, um, and we were thinking about doing a hydrogen valley in the North Negev of Israel. And for some reasons, first of all, it's an area with a lot of uh, solar uh, potential. Uh, most of the year you have uh, full days with the full uh, sun potential. You have uh, industry around that area that uh, uh, chemical industry, uh, fertilizer industry that are using uh, hydrogen and have the ability to start uh, 
uh, immediately with the blue hydrogen. We just need to use the carbon capture. And uh, we have natural gas pipelines going all the way south, so uh, we can utilize natural gas as the beginning. Uh, we have uh, geological structures for carbon uh, sequestration. Um, so uh, we can have the start, start point of the blue, blue nitrogen. Then with the solar, uh, we can move uh, forward for uh, green hydrogen. And uh, our end, uh, end, end the place for the area is further up uh, north in Ashdod. We have a major harbor over there. Uh, the distance is not uh, too large for this kind of uh, valleys. It's a few dozen uh, kilometers. So around 70, 80 kilometers, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we have uh, railroads uh, and all available infrastructure to, to, to transport all the uh, commodities. And we have power stations uh, in the vicinity that can use uh, uh, the products. Um, we, we also thought about if you have electri electrolyzer, electrolyzers, um, we have uh, oxygen as a, as a byproduct that can be a uh, feedstock for a certain type of power plants to reduce the uh, NOx uh, pollution. So that's another thing we can think of or other ways to use this product. Um, in the South of Israel, there's a strong uh, political uh, support to, uh, to have these uh, industries we have uh, better subsidies, better taxes over there for uh, for the industry, and a strong political uh, lobby to to have uh, industries there uh, down south. Be'er Sheva is a uh, is a university city, so we can have uh, research and development centers, um, and uh, partnership with academia. And I think that's pretty much sums this up. Uh, ah, another thing that we may have is uh, storage uh, possibilities uh, in uh, salt caverns uh, closer to the Dead Sea. And this is uh, something we're working on in Israel with the Geological uh, Institute. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ron. Um, again, um, very well uh, considered the, the, the geographical advantages in the position between let's say the Mediterranean and the and the and the Red Sea. It's a yeah, Red Sea. Uh, sorry? Okay. No, I wanted to ask no, I wanted to ask Iran to uh, stop sharing, but if I'm already saying something, then Iran is uh, working at the Israeli Ministry of Energy. Uh, just for ah, your background. So, uh, worthwhile uh, notification. Thank you. Um so so I think it's ge geographically very good. Uh, start with blue fade into uh, fade in uh, the, the green i think that's a fitting um, uh, local uh, advantage you have some chemical industry there you didn't touch upon the transport via road but you mentioned rail already so maybe i think there is a fairly well road connection uh, uh, passing very, right? very well road connection we have yeah. the rail system uh, yeah yeah i think that's good i think i think you you mentioned a very very interesting topic that's the the availability of uh, availability and utilization of oxygen to reduce uh nox uh, from let's say utilizing directly hydrogen in the, in high temperature processes that could be a very very interesting attribute and i haven't heard that so much in in the in the, in the hydrogen community yet but i think that's a very interesting one and of course if you could feed upon and touch upon let's say the regions uh, ambitions from the political side and subsidies and uh, uh, creating um, uh, a, a, a investment, uh, uh, um, what's the word, uh, uh, potential, you, you will attract other parties to, to acquire. And you mentioned, didn't, didn't mention one thing because um, you need hydrogen, you need oxygen, and you need water, of course. Uh, and I know that Israel has a very highly developed, high, high end, high notch, not. Uh, Champsovic type of water uh, industry with uh, desalination, et cetera. That could be a, an attribute of, of course as well, because you need water to to uh, be able to electrolyze. Yeah, it's, um, it's in our plan. Uh, we have oh, a desalination okay. plant in uh, Ashkelon that can be used. Uh, uh, 
the, all the water pipelines that we have in Israel, or use the actual North Negev uh, uh, salt aquifers to yeah. create a new desalination plan if if yeah. if it needs uh, yeah. if we need it. It's going to be expensive it's... though. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but no, 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 better, no, no, better solution. Sorry. Yes, Patrick, go ahead. Okay, um, um, and, but, but you didn't touch upon. I'm not not familiar with the wind conditions in the Negev. I think most most desert regions do have wind, as, or is it is it the, is it the, the, the poor in wind? Wind wind is uh, at the time problematic uh, in Israel. We have uh, very uh, few wind corridors. And most of them have a lot of uh, objections by uh, environmental groups because of uh, bird uh, migrations and other uh, other things. But we may have uh, in the future offshore wind or uh, things like that. Uh, yeah. that we and also, about. and also for you, yeah. another question: How how big? What what would be the 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 the, uh, the capacity or the investment volume? Do you have an, a rule, an idea, suggestion? Okay. I, I think, you know. If I may just interrupt, uh, I'm Tomer, I'm from Parallel Group. We did the same uh, project on the same area. And there, this is a, a concrete project. We're leading uh, Hydrogen Valley uh, development around Dimona, a center city, a central city in the Negev, uh, with the largest uh, uh, solar facility uh, in Israel being built. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, a, a, and it will have 500 megawatts uh, uh, capacity, and a lot more uh, fields uh, are being built, uh, and the capacity will be even bigger. Oh, see, and okay, region, great. And, uh, region wise. Yeah, and, uh, the, 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 and you mentioned it already, uh, Iran. You, you also would in, in entangle the university, that's the, the, the research uh, capacity from the university, and the same goes, of course, for the other two. Uh, if you can do that, you make it so inclusive. Because you need some uh, probably some innovations to run down costs and get the innovation there going. So I think it's it's yeah it's, I think it's yeah pretty nice and also is a, a nice let's say the three presented until now are quite different from each other, but there are some similarities. Yeah. The similarities is is predominantly get the government in, get the ambitions uh, right, um, and then uh, hold on to your thoughts because I think it's it's a it's a I think it's it's also a very interesting case. Of course, only limited time to reflect, but I'm really, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. You answered all the questions, I think, and and especially you mentioned that of the um, of the um, uh, the availability for CO two storage in already, uh, let's say, uh, uh, fitting geological structures to to store away the uh, the carbon the carbon dioxide. Okay, very good. Thank you. Rachel, may I? Thank. Sorry, no, not at the moment. Really. First, we will let the, the other groups make their presentation with your permission. The next group will be, uh, Patrick, a presentation on a hydrogen valley in uh, Dubai. Um, Leo Khabib or any other group uh, representative, if you can uh, pitch. Can I, I share, please? Can, can I share, please? Yes, of course. Thanks, Leo. Okay, so thank you for the option to introduce the winning team. We choose uh, Dubai. Uh, the team includes Israelis, uh, Netherlands, and India. Uh, we chose Dubai because it's a small geographical uh, area, but we learned that uh, things are happening in Dubai. Uh, Dubai location is uh, very promising, as you see in the map, and the geological structure of the shore uh, can assist with implementing some storage of uh, hydrogen in this area. Dubai is already engaged in some hydrogen projects, as like uh, in production and export to Japan and South Korea, and also they are in connections with uh, Siemens in Germany to use their electrolyzers. Uh, we want to go to decarbonize Dubai, decarbonize Dubai and make it international hub. Uh, we can use the huge solar, solar uh, fields that are happening uh, in Dubai, same also like in Israel, there is a strong chemical presence of companies, polymers, of course, desalination, which is a huge uh, demand of electricity for the reverse osmosis pumps, and also ammonia plants that are being built, which is also a big uh, uh, demand for H2. Uh, we see also the airport as an interesting field 
to supply hydrogen through aviation, transportation, maybe UPS can do some nice projects in Dubai. Uh, we can store the hydrogen and use it at night for backup instead of uh, using lithium ion batteries. Uh, a last thing that we start to think about, if you look at the map, there are also some projects that are being spoken between Emirates and Israel to supply direct oil using pipelines from uh, Emirates to the south of Israel and then directly to the west of Israel and to, the, and to Europe. This is how you can bypass all the ships that are going through south of Africa. So this is something interesting. We have no clue how much it can cost, but can be nice feasibility studies for the EU and get funds for it. And uh, that's it. Uh, hold on, I'm uh, just making some notes. Uh, Amir, uh, in projects. Uh, okay. um, Amir is working uh, for a private consultancy firm. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for explaining. And um, as we all know, Dubai has a very strong position already in the, in the traditional energy sector. And there are some uh, some big developments around in and around Dubai related to solar, and the uh, same goes, of course, for the for the, the other countries in the in the on the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, I think it's very logical. You you touched upon solar, of course. That's your let's say the the the, the main uh, electricity generator. Then a chemical offtake polymers, very interesting because it's high end uh, direct uh, in application. Ammonia as a carrier. Uh, and of course, the, 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 there is some vast desalination installations already in the region, which require a lot of electricity. So that that's a interesting uh, offtaker. And especially you mentioned the aviation. That's very interesting because aviation is a hard to abate sector. And I think looking at hydrogen direct application in airplanes as a fuel will take some some years, especially for the heavy carriers, which Dubai has a position in as a, as a aviation hub. But it, I think it certainly could be an interesting thing to combine with, for instance, the initiatives of uh, oil companies like Shell to produce sustainable aviation fuel and use it directly because that is a direct hit and is, is exemplary. The storage is, of course, very important. And I really like the direct thought of reutilizing existing um, uh, oil pipeline infrastructure. Because if you have a tranche, a, a, a route, you can put another pipeline besides it or refurbish another one and especially the connection to let's say Israel and then I think to Ashdod Harbor probably uh, is very interesting because that would connect this region directly via the the transit region of Israel if I may put it like that to connect to let's say the pipelines going to Europe and I think they are going over Cyprus or so direction Greece so that that's more or less as far as I think that's excellent and that would be certainly something to to bring to the table and to um, and concrete that, to, to work out somewhat more because uh, that will bring, let's say, harvesting the sun and bringing it to Europe closer and not only Europe, but also the, the other domains like, like Japan, which in which Dubai is already making steps. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I really like it. And do you have an idea on the on the investment magnitude, Amir, or, or is it still a bit too far off and too, too, too difficult to say something about it? Uh -huh. We have uh, no clue yet. No. Money is not an issue over there. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's we, it, we thought that it would be easier. Yeah, yes, yeah, of course, this is a very, let's say, wealthy uh, region, but, but I think Dubai has a very good, well organized uh, sovereign wealth fund. Uh, uh, so I think money shouldn't be the main issue, it's more ambition and um, uh, making it happen, uh, you know. and. and and the interesting thing is with all the, the values until presented on now, the if you put your mind to it, it's sometimes it's so logical that you may oversee some things which are too easy, seem to be too easy, but it can be done. Uh, and so I would certainly advise to work this out further because this is bringing the sun to Europe. Uh, with, yeah. Especially in our region, we have no sun now, it's rainy, it's very bad weather. Don't, don't you think, I want to ask, don't you think that with all the political problems there in that area to take a ship, a ships with hydrogen is maybe too dangerous? Oh, I think that's a, it's a very, very interesting question. Uh, your name is in, 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 in Hebrew, I can't. I can't. Amnon, no, no, my name is in red, oh, Amnon. Amnon, no, then it is, oh, it's, it's hidden away. Apologies on them. Well, yeah, I think um, safety issues uh, related to energy security and security supply 
should always be uh, looked upon uh, intensively. Uh, I'm not a politician. Uh, uh, I do see what's going on in the world, but uh, I think safety and safe transport is, is of course, very important. Uh, but I think there are many people in, 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 the, in the region and uh, in the Middle East, I says, who, who have a keen eye on that. Uh, I, I do, but I do think it's it's important to in any way, in any way, uh, to look upon the safety and the handling of this. Well, it's it's you know, hydrogen is a has an intrinsic uh, characteristic, but let's not forget natural gas is also quite uh, well, uh, ignite ignitable. Uh, everything can uh, go up and, and come down, but uh, safety is very important, especially if you use ships. But uh, if you use it in a pipeline. Of course, you have to look into how to do it with which compressors, etc. But that's in general; it has to be safe. Otherwise, uh, well, uh, you have to rethink uh, the solution. But I do agree. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Patrick. Just you know that Amnon is uh, I'm sure is from uh, the ICL group. The group also has uh, headquarters in the Netherlands, which is also a uh, foreign direct investment uh, project of my colleagues here at the uh, Dutch Embassy in Israel. Um, okay. So thank you so much for presenting uh, the Hydron Valley in uh, Dubai. Um, I would like to move now to uh, Istanbul, and I'm inviting Osbu to uh, pitch on the Hydron Valley to be developed in Istanbul. Hello to everyone. I would like to uh, describe why we choose to Istanbul shortly. Uh, in a nutshell, in a nutshell, Istanbul has like huge opportunity in terms of the domestic uh, consumption and also great export capabilities. And I will also share my screen because it's better to describe over the map. Yeah, there we also choose the port and near the Istanbul. You may know Istanbul has like 15 million population. So the domestic consumption in terms of natural gas is huge. So, and uh, as a port, as you can see here, there's a uh, airport, which is really close to, to our port. So we can feed this port in the future as well. This port also, I mean, our valley is really close to existing natural gas pipelines which are the 36 inches. And these have uh, opportunities to export to uh, Bulgaria and Greece and uh, other Balkan countries, as well as Romania, Moldova, and Ukraine. Why? Because in the Soviet Union era, uh, Turkey signed with the Soviet Union to get natural gas from the Westline. Westline is now useless because of South Stream. But now we can use this existing pipeline to transport the gas to Bulgaria, Romania, Moldova, and Ukraine. And also now uh, from the Russia to Turkey South Stream, existing pipelines also are feeding right now Bulgaria, Serbia, and even Hungary and Bosnia, and again Greece. So in terms of exporting capacity, we have really huge opportunity. What about the storage? We have also a distinct deployed uh, gas storage system here, Slivery. I will show the, from the National Gas Company of Turkey here. Uh, there is also the existing underground storage facility. As you can see, Turkey has really uh, well improved uh, grid. So here also in the two, 2023, they are expanding the salt currents, which equals to 5.1 BCM. Uh, natural gas storage. So you can also store the uh, hydrogen here. And also in addition, there is also the LNG uh, port here and also FSRU capability, which you can also export by ship even from here or from here to, to other countries. Again, Ukraine, even Russia or Georgia. These are the main actually driven uh, factors why we choose the Istanbul. Uh, regarding the off-takers, as I said, export, uh, actually, sorry, we, first of all, I want to say, uh, we choose the archetype three because of the uh, export capabilities and the domestic consumption. As I said, the airport is so close and the Istanbul has really huge population. And also uh, 
here well, I will also show uh, there are four industrial zones. These industrial zones is so close where we choose. It's, I, didn't, I think like a hundred kilometer. These four industrial zone has uh, accommodates uh, various sectors, uh, maybe 500 companies from like small scale to large scale. And also here that region that is connected with the existing pipelines. These are the oil refinery in Turkey also. There are some oil refineries and ammonia producers over there also. So you can easily link from our port to, by using the existing pipelines to the main consump consumption. And what else? Uh, regarding the uh, public funding, uh, Turkish president already announced uh, the, the interest regarding the initiative, the green economy. So also for, for private, private sector is also keen to uh, fund the, this green economy. And also in terms of the uh, power, you, all, you cannot always rely on the renewables in one place. Turkey also regulated, regulator already uh, started Publishment of green power certification, which is really good. You can use existing electric grid as well. And what else? And uh, regarding the uh, end users, you can also use the mobility sector because uh, you know from the east part of the west part, Turkey is a kind of bridge. So the mm -hmm. near near our port, there is a international highway. So you can use this hydrogen also in the truck sector. Mm -hmm. And what else? Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of okay, we are always like thinking and designing regarding these hydrogen lights. But in terms of construction, Turkey uh, has really good companies in, in terms of the EPC uh, EPC companies. This is really good point as well. And, and being a hub also a really crucial point because the now hydrogen economy will will grow actually. So we will want to create a hub in the Southeast Europe. Uh, and also we want to run like a natural gas uh, market. So in terms of that uh, condition also, uh, Turkey has a huge capability because they have already, uh, they have already exist, which is energy exchange uh, Istanbul. So you can later on maybe trade this hydrogen uh, in the future. Actually, that's all. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Patrick Thank you. is looking at the South Stream Transport railway. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Osgur, for this uh, extensive uh, elaboration. I think Istanbul has a lot of potential because it has been always a, a, a turning uh, a position a turning position between the west and the east uh, from from tradition and there are vast energy infrastructures there already um tapping on to let's say the potential of the south stream and the other uh, uh, um, pipelines is, is very very yes it's very interesting because now it is used as a transit uh, location, getting Russian uh, gas, et cetera, to the West. Mm -hmm. But uh, this become, maybe becomes more obsolete due to North Stream, et cetera. But then there's the reutilization connecting to Greece and Bulgaria, and potentially also connecting to, let's say, pipelines coming maybe from Israel, is a very interesting and strong point because it, 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 it gives a good position in that uh, respect. You have the gas storage facilities there, FRSU, FSRUs, LNG, mm -hmm. that's there uh, already. You, you touch upon the mobility uh, with the trucks and the and the and the and the, um, uh, the, 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 the highways connected to uh, Europe. I think that is one of the that is. I think it's connected to one of the uh, SEF core corridors in Europe. And yes, exactly. I think that's, mm -hmm. So that that hits on very well. There are initiatives in Bulgaria and Greece already looking to tap upon these uh, funding. So that's really interesting. And for the for the airport, uh, we ourselves have engaged in some project with uh, with the other airport, the, the new one, uh, um, Istanbul Grand Airport at the, at the <laughs> southern side. So that's really 
a very interesting proposition you offer because Istanbul is a me is a metropole like like uh, like Singapore and it offers a lot of opportunities because of the the fastness of the energy they're using already uh, and the carbon penalties coming from that okay. and the air quality etc and and of course one of the things if you if you look at peninsula or island communities take a strong look at the ferries because uh, uh, people use it there are not enough bridges <laughs> mm. in the end and that would be a very interesting because if you want to explain that hydrogen is safe mobility is a very good instrument because everybody knows a bus everybody knows a ferry and of course it's safe if you step into the bus or onto the ferry that could be a very interesting idea as an addition and uh, have you already had some ideas on on the investment magnitude actually no we haven't discussed uh, but i think it will be like uh, a lot i can say because <laughs> you can you can feed with the existing pipelines to other countries as well yeah. this is really good opportunities in terms of export so you yeah. need to if you want to be market you want to be uh how can i say big yeah. actually yeah, yeah but i can say really... the magnitude yeah no, no, okay. I understand. It's uh, it's something to 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 deepen your thoughts about. And mm -hmm. I really like it, and especially you know, the 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 positioning of Istanbul related to let's say the 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 round the round table position between let's say the the east and the west, as uh, has always fitted to Istanbul uh, from uh, from history on. So that really fits in very well. You can make a really good storyline about that. I think. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Sorry, where is the production coming from? I didn't get it. Actually, you can get from the existing uh, wind farm, uh, which is really close to in the that region, in the Black Sea region. And also, as I said, you can't always rely on the renewables, in even the solar, even the wind. So that's why uh, you can get the from the existing electric grid, but you will get the green certified electric from the existing grid. So you can get from the maybe south part of Turkey, south, uh, south part of Turkey's sun uh, uh, to to your uh, hydrogen production side yeah. from That's the electric grid. That, That's all. Yeah, you mentioned the the initiative in the, in the, in the, in the Saba newspaper related to the green certificates, I think. Yeah, yes, exactly. So exactly. Yeah, this yeah, is, this yeah. is another point, actually. Yeah, interesting, very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Osgul. And um, before I introduce um, our last uh, speaker, uh, who will uh, present the Hydron Valley in Morocco, I wanted to point out to all of you that Morocco will uh, receive special focus tomorrow when we have the uh, presentation by Tariq Khamane uh, from Masin in Morocco. He will tell us about a hydrogen project in the region and he will also point out what is happening in Saudi Arabia uh, in the city of Lyon and the Helios uh, project. Um, so Patrick, our last presentation is going to be about a hydrogen valley in Morocco. And I asked Tim Evert, um, who works at Taruka in the Netherlands, to uh, make the pitch. Hi, afternoon, everyone. Uh, just to share my screen. Um, Okay, um, the, the reason we chose Morocco is um, how we said about this initially uh, as a team was looking at um, at proximity to, to energy, clean energy sources, and then proximity to markets. Um, and so um, from a renewable energy perspective, um, Morocco currently has 20% 20 20 of its energy supplied by renewables, and they plan to go to 52% by 2030. Um, and there is also this whole project which has been hanging in the balance for a long time, which is the whole desert tech project, which plans to, the intention of which is to supply 20% of uh, Europe's electricity um, from, from solar projects um, in, in Northern Africa. The other reason we chose Morocco was in terms of, of, of transportation um, and transport corridors. Um, it's well situated. We envisage that we would possibly put the plant in Tangier. 
And then from a shipping perspective, it sits at one of the eight top shipping uh, routes uh, in the globe. So from that perspective, we think it's very well positioned um, for both clean energy and for, um, for, for market. So based on that, um, we, um, in, in terms of the markets, uh, we see that the, the markets would definitely be the shipping industry. Um, also, uh, uh, Morocco is the world's largest producer of, of phosphates. Um, so we could, we are, we are aware that there are plants at the moment to to produce mono, uh, ammonia. Um, so the potential could be to expand that um, that production of ammonia uh, as a market, but definitely shipping and the possibility then to to pipe across to to Europe, or maybe set up a kind of smaller plant in in, in southern part of Spain. Um, yeah. So that and then. Um, in terms of, so in terms of the of of the market potential um we in terms of the archetype we think this speaks more to an archetype type three um so from a value chain perspective that would include production storage uh, and transportation um, in terms of competition we are aware that there is a bit of competition in that marketplace and we need to explore that a bit more uh, we do understand that the agreement between the German government and Morocco to build a, a hydrogen plant has been put on hold. Um, but whether that's a, a small kind of hurdle in the road, we're not sure. So we need to explore that whole, that whole, um, that whole competitive market. There is another memorandum of understanding that has been signed for two other plants. Uh, from a government perspective, we think. There, there are some political issues that have kind of hampered past decisions, I think. So how smooth that may may flow, we're not sure. Uh, but currently, we, we do believe that there's a lot of interest in exploring this. Um, and then from a funding and size perspective, we're not too sure. Um, just initial indications would be 500 megawatts plus um, funding. We need to explore that. So yeah, that's... Uh, that's the Morocco team. Uh, we might change our minds tomorrow after we hear the presentation. Thanks, Tim. Sure. I'll have to stop sharing. Still. You're on mute, Patrick. I'm, I'm sorry. So, uh, Tim, thank you for the elaboration, uh, elucidation. Uh, we know that Morocco has a big potential. We, we as Dutch, we had several uh, seminars with them already in the past month. I think jo Jochen can also provide, I think, the, the links to that uh, to give you some more insights to everybody in, in, in the call, actually. Um, I think you hit upon a very logical place, Tangier, to have the production and the, the off-takers because they are coming together there because of the, the shipping intensity. Um, I'm not really sure where where the ammonia where the fertilizer production is geographically, but suppose it's in the region. And of course, phosphate is one of the one of the one of the minerals which is uh, difficult to get in the world. Uh, there are only a, a few big deposits. Morocco is, I think, the fastest one. Maybe next to Chile, I'm, I'm not sure who's one or two. So that's a very interesting one. We need a, a fertilizer production, so ammonia is there. So that can be a very logical step up for that uh, and then indeed morocco also ha already has an interesting uh, renewable production capacity uh, will, which will go up and if you build it connected to the industry that makes a lot of sense and especially also because of morocco the vicinity of morocco to spain gives a lot of opportunities as, as a transit corridor because you need to bring it to the market and the closer the market is the better it is i think so uh, europe is more uh, uh, logical than, let's say, uh, Australia, for that matter. Uh, uh, um, in the competition, you need to look into that in, um, on a market basis. Um, I think the Moroccan government could certainly tap onto uh, several funding schemes, uh, not only uh, the European Investment Bank, but also the World Bank. They're very, I think they are very eager to, to help because in 
in in in, in the local kind of countries. It, it's about also about bringing prosperity to the country, upgrading the the standard of living, etc. All these kind of things. The size five hundred megawatts sounds logical. I hear five hundred megawatts in every presentation in every Hajj Valley. So there may be something to it to, and also think about the joint development on on these electrolyzers. If you have, if you can can buy five times five hundred, makes it more easier to get the big companies like Siemens and Thyssen Group and uh, and Nell and uh, don't want to miss anybody uh, to 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 step into that jointly because that makes a lot of a lot of sense. And for that matter, we we are in in Groningen here in, in the Netherlands. We have a megawatt test center under a, under a development in which we want to develop gigawatt scale electrolyzers. So there may be an interesting combination for all of you to take that in, take that into consideration. And along the way, we because you you need to build the thing, you need to maintain it, you need to the skilled workers. And I think um, Osgo said that uh, I think many countries also have a good EPC domain engineer procurement and construction parties so uh, uh which can be which are absolutely needed to 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 bring this further uh so and and, and so yeah yeah it's it's very well let's say thought about let's say the 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 the, the region of ge geographical advantages and assets like phosphate etc which are already there and there you can see that every every region has a different approach to being a, uh, to become an hydro valley but what my sense is that everybody sees the opportunities engaging in this uh, endeavor. So uh, I think that's that's excellent, and uh, it also gives me some some ideas, uh, which when I put them down to paper, I'll make sure that you receive it from uh, from me through Rochum or Racheli. Because think about what Bart this morning said, and our president of the union said, "I want to see more hunting valleys," uh, and I think she didn't necessarily say we need it all in Europe but we need to connect it we need to work together and if we for instance these six hydrogen valleys in addition to the ones we already have makes a lot of makes a lot of it's, it's so logical it's so rational and it starts with an ambition and hold on to that because without ambition we get we'll get nowhere and we have to do it if we don't do this these kinds of investments we will never uh, in no way uh, tackle the climate um problem as we face it and will face it in the in the in the near future so for for, for me that's until uh, so far excellent you thanks could, could as patrick could you make sorry. a comment about whether sorry you know, one second okay there was someone else who wanted to say something beforehand and i said i will introduce him but one second <clears throat> and one comment also to Patrick, in Hebrew, there is this expression uh, that Nikol Talmidai is healthy. That means that I can learn from every pupil or student. And I hear now, after you've heard these six presentations, that you're also learning from us. And uh, I think yeah. this is very valuable. Um, and we're very pleased about this. So I would like to uh, suggest the following. We have another, let's say, 10 minutes in order to uh, sum up this fantastic day. Uh, with really um, questions that address uh, general topics so that we can continue learning from this. And the first question will be asked by uh, Uri Atil, also from Israel. Uri, please. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, Racheli. Uh, just in addition, for the Israeli project where the hydrogen valley is in the Negev, first of all, the production of ammonia. Israel is importing ammonia right now. Ammonia is not only needed for local fertilizers, but it's needed for as a raw material for, and for ammonium nitrate, which is a, a very important exported uh, fertilizer in Israel. And instead of importing it and, and shipping it by from, from the sea uh, to the Ashdod port and from there uh, to the Negev, uh, it would be a, a great opportunity to produce ammonia from hydrogen instead of from natural gas, which is a clean ammonia production. Second thing I want to add is in the same area, there are two chlorine caustic plants uh, in the Dead Sea that use hydrogen as a raw material, that nothing is done with it right now. It's totally to the air. So this is a, a source, a small source of hydrogen, which I could add up. The most important thing I want to add is that you were talking about the, where is the water going to come from and we need water and desalinations. Well, let me tell you, there is a process being developed right now at the Technion called a desalination fuel cell. 
that uses hydrogen as a major raw material to desalinate water. So in Israel's next desalination plant, instead of it being from reverse osmosis, where you use electricity and the electricity that will be used for the next one will probably be from natural gas, unfortunately. So instead of using more electricity from natural gas, we can use, we can actually uh, use hydrogen to produce the same desalinated amount of water. But in this process, we get electricity as a byproduct. So we are producing green electricity instead of consuming it and desalinating water. This could definitely be part of this Israeli hydrogen valley. Okay. Oh, oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. Looking at the last one, I do agree with that. It's it's all about you know innovation and think think further. Have have a broad look upon it because I do agree. If you can use let's say the electricity as a byproduct and reuse it in in, in a good way, that makes a lot of sense. It reduces your footprint, and uh, that's what it's about. And uh, especially, also, I like your, your remark to the chloroalkaline plant. And normally, they, they produce chlorine for chemical purposes mostly, uh, and hydrogen is a byproduct. And in general, if you don't use it for electricity power generation on the chemical park, you could really use that as an addition to ramp up the volumes quite quickly, especially if uh, the chloroalkaline plant would use renewable electricity. It's it's two uh, two jokers at one time, um, and as you said, indeed, um, instead of importing the uh, uh, the fertilizer, why not produce it yourself with the, with the green resources you have? Uh, reduces not only transport, but it makes a lot of sense from the regional um, economical uh, the regional economical uh, perspective. Keep the money in the region; it's better than import exporting the money by selling it some, buying it somewhere else. So I, I really like that. And, and you triggered me with the desalination uh, uh, approach, going from reverse osmosis to the other process, uh, going the other way around and creating a benefit from a, um, let's say, a situation which is uh, consuming energy now. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I hope that now for the first time in these last two days, we also um, touched upon the fact that Israel is also known as startup nation. And here we can see again uh, how Israelis um, come up with new developments uh, that can address the hydrogen sector. The next uh, question will be posed by uh, Shelly Zalgari, uh, the business development uh, from GenCell Technologies. Shelly, the floor is yours. Oh, okay. Thanks. Actually, I wrote my question in the in the chat now, Patrick. I was wondering if you could comment about the the whole issue. Uh, you know, obviously, any hydrogen valley needs hydrogen production, and uh, in some countries, there are you know Denmark and other places there are a bit more manufacturers than in others. So, uh, how would you recommend that if we try to push our projects ahead, that uh, how can we um, uh, entice the um, electrolyzer manufacturers to get involved with us when there's such a huge demand for electrolyzers everywhere? Yep. Well, that's a good question, Shelley. Uh, thank you for that. Um, of course, in order to uh, uh, create this, this, this opportunity we see, we need production capacity and we need electrolyzers. And there are many electrolyzer producers, as you mentioned, I won't mention them all because they're from Denmark, from Germany, from the US and, and all over the place, etc. I think in order to entice them and embed them in, in, in the relevant projects, I think they also need to learn to work together because it makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's not about uh, building, let's say, a few uh, 500 megawatt electrolyzers now. It's about, let's say, this 40 gigawatt and even more ambition we have. It can only be done not by, not by one party. It's, it, it involves a lot of parties, and I think it would be, would be very interesting to combine their knowledge. Why not, you know, if you build an electrolyzer, and maybe there's something to do for the governments there, if you put on the, out a, a procurement for an electrolyzer system, let's say 500 megawatts, why not propose that it is beneficial for the contractor if they come up with a, uh, a joint proposition instead of single propositions? You know, it's, it's always very, it's always very difficult because. Uh, but I do agree with you. It makes a lot more sense to develop, let's say, a 500 megawatt system jointly, rather than separately, because then you would waste a lot of resources, and we don't have the luxury at this moment in time 
to uh, have all kinds of uh, distributed uh, uh, innovations. We must focus on big scale because the big scale will help us challenge this big problem. So, but it's a very good question. I, I don't have an immediate answer, of course, but I would advocate put them in a the room together and lock the door and let them out when they have a solution, which is jointly. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. There is one more question of Ellie Winkler. Ellie, if you can come uh, online with your camera uh, yes. open. Uh, I would like, I have two questions actually, uh, Patrick. Uh, you have a very long uh, lasting uh, experience with natural gas. Recently, uh, we uh, encountered a, a big uh, a amount of natural gas in our uh, region, and it's uh, a, a big uh, treasure uh, for, for Israel. What is uh, your uh, recommendation to neglect these uh, big reservoirs? We, we have uh, up to uh, 800 uh, billion uh, cubic meter uh, 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 for, for the time and uh, perhaps in the in the future it might be more yeah i th think thank you uh, Idai. It's, it's a very justified question you're related to the leviathan field and the other fields uh, near uh, uh, near the israeli or in the israeli uh, uh, off sea uh, offshore domain i would say i think we we will need natural gas for a long time still but in order to 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 harvest the natural gas you need to put uh, infrastructure systems in place to get the the natural gas from the subsurface to to the user centers if that infrastructure could be made hydrogen ready already that would be a good thing and i think it's also why not look into, into the potential of producing blue hydrogen if you have these vast amounts uh, because that makes a lot of sense. Um, and of course, maybe there is also something to it that if you have natural gas reserves, you want to make money, you want to make money with it. Put it like the Norwegians do in the... In I, the would, I, I would suppose uh, to piece uh, hydrogen. We will uh, look on to piece hydrogen and also as an environmental, uh, yeah. almost green hydrogen. Yeah, you know, it's it's a, well. The challenge we have is tremendous. So every 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 little contribu every contribution is, is 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 welcome. But I would say, if you tap onto the natural gas reserves, why not put in the blue hydrogen strategy immediately, uh, in in order to have the the green one grow. But look into aspects like not creating a lock in, have a a good parity, and maybe for every cubic meter of natural gas you sell. Put aside uh, ten or twenty percent of the income to develop the green hydrogen. Th that could be done, you know. It's a, uh, but certainly I'm, I'm very much aware of this vast, vast reservoirs in, in amongst the Alpha Leviathan field, and it's it's really a, it's a big asset. And if the asset helps you to become green, uh, don't neglect it. Thank you. Uh, may I ask another question? Yes. Is it a short one because there's one more question, and then uh, we would like to end. Okay. You men, uh, Patrick, you mentioned uh, uh, methanol production from uh, uh, hydrogen uh, in, uh, in your uh, valley. Uh, to, to commence it, uh, 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 to convert it to uh, e-fuels or, or uh, uh, kerosene for, for the aviation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering why not directly to make fissure crop synthesis uh, from the from what you have. Why uh, is this the stage? Uh, I see, and maybe I wasn't too clear. We have a big methanol production already, which will feed upon the green hydrogen, which is going to be produced. And separately, there will be a, let's say, a clean or green kerosene uh, production installed. So it's not related, but they are actually next to each other. Uh, locally, oh. let's say, in, in the location. So it's not, maybe I didn't explain it uh, in, in full, but uh, uh, the methanol will have its own uses and the kerosene, of course, needs to go uh, to help us uh, fly over the world in the, in a clean way. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. And the last question will be asked by Pranav Tetali. And then uh, we're going to finish our second day. Pranav, the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rakeli. 
uh, my question is you uh, is it is there a difference between uh, combining hydrogen hydrogen valley with with wind asset or hydrogen valley with solar asset because i usually at least in europe i hear generally it's we have talked about combining with wind but not much with solar is there a difference or it doesn't make much no no it's it's, it's just in 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 our geographies in in the netherlands we are very near the north sea uh, we have a lot of wind in the North Sea. Uh, we are generally not a really uh, a sun-rich country, so we we adapt to uh, using the the offshore wind as the as a very important source. If you go to sun-rich countries, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense to to use the sun as the source for your hydrogen. And of course, there will be regions in which both will be uh, will be attending. So there is now really a a a, a predominance for the one and the other. It's more. Geo geography dependent. If you have a, have, have a lot of wind and less sun, use the wind, of course. Uh, and I think looking, looking for instance, to India, it's it's a big country, uh, so there's a lot of sun. But I think there are also some some regions where the the wind is uh, is uh, predictable, especially higher up in, uh, I think in the in the, in the Kashmir region, etc. As far as I know, it's quite windy always. So so I, I would that that depend on the local or regional. Um, uh, preferences. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you so much. And I'd like to add now, uh, Pat, that you can also see the international aspect because Pranav uh, Tetali, he is the founder of a Dutch startup called Only Wind uh, Bay Bay. Um, so there is also a Dutch angle, but it's nice that you address um, his country of origin. Anyway, I'd like to summarize our day. Uh, if you remember, hours and hours ago, hours and hours ago, we had the presentation of Bart Bubik uh, from the fuel cell hydrogen, and he told us about the financing of the hydrogen valleys, how everything started, and what are the projects uh, that are currently running, and those that uh, Europe is looking at uh, in the next coming years, including uh, projects outside uh, Europe. And I think that what we did uh, during our hands-on that uh, could be of interest to uh, future cell uh, hydrogen joint initiatives, and there will be funding for these projects. So uh, sharpen your project ideas, and maybe, who knows, you will be get funded. Then uh, after Bart's presentation, we had the excellent presentation of Patrick um, on how he actually worked on the uh, concept of a hydrogen valleys and uh, indeed, Patrick, you could see that with your serious approach and your tenacity and um, ambition and motivation, you not only set up the uh, Heaven um, Hydrogen Valley and you sustain it, but you also inspired um, the entire group um, so that when the people in those 19 groups of five people each, that means it's almost 100 people who went through an enormous learning exercise this afternoon, came up with some brilliant ideas for a different um, hydrogen valleys. What I find very interesting is that you can actually see that in a very short period of time, people, when we work together, we can come up with a lot of concrete and excellent ideas, much more than if we had done this ourselves. So Jochem and I have been asking you for days and days now to go over the, uh, the case and make sure that you understand it. And the, the, I think the, the, um, the climax of what Jochem and I tried to do in this uh, hydrogen uh, summer school is that you will work together. And we have achieved this and we're very pleased with it. Um, as we will uh, set you free in one minute, um, this is not before you will um, have the time to write your written assignment, invest in it. It's not for us, it's mainly for you. And uh, Jochem and I will devote our evening hours to go over your written assignments and to provide you with feedback. Um, as an Israeli, you know, I'm also an Israeli, uh, we very much like uh, things to move very fast. And in my communication with Jochem, uh, I already asked him whether there are some uh, ideas here that were uh, raised in each of these 19 groups that could be of interest to you, Patrick, and the new energy coalition. And uh, who knows, maybe out of this uh, very nice afternoon, um, new hydrogen valleys could come uh, to the attention of big players like New Energy Coalition. So I would like to thank all of you. I'd like to thank Jochem for all the tedious uh, cooperation 
and investments, I'd like to thank Leo and Avner who were responsible for all the technical issues of which you will also uh, benefit and profit uh, once we will release uh, our uh, recordings of uh, what we have done so far. And with this, I uh, end our day and invite you all back with new energy uh, tomorrow morning, quarter to nine Central European time and quarter to 10 Israeli time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.